different kind of interview because it's not going to really be an interview. It's going to be more. Thank God. <laughs> Gee, you sound like the voiceover guy, James Earl Jones. Where is he? I don't see him. Yeah. <laughs> He's invisible. We can't actually. If Gabe Sapolsky was invisible, it actually brought more money. <laughs> I, I'd like to thank Ring of Honor, first of all, for bringing us here to beautiful downtown Newark, New Jersey. Now I know how political prisoners feel. We're, we're this, is Newark? this is Newark. Oh. It was going time ago. <laughs> We're trapped in this enclosed conclave. You have to go through a gate to get in the parking lot. If you leave the grounds, you turn right. You're in the Newark Airport, an endless maze where you all get lost. If you turn left, you go to New York City downtown, cross the bridge, you never get back. Uh, the pork shop dinner is $26, the cheeseburgers are 19 bucks with the room service tax, uh, and you're afraid to leave the, the grounds. It's like the green zone in Iraq. I still got to go upstairs and untie the maid. <laughs> But it hasn't been, it's been a nice day here. Yes, actually. It, Pardon it, my speech. I mean, I'm recovering from throat cancer, as you know, and some of the words uh, sound a little funny. I'm not slow or retarded. I'm just uh, a half a tongue in the back. But well, well, don't worry. That's why they gave his fingers so we can talk. The more you talk, the less Gabe will talk. And, <laughs> Start I've, talking. I've done these before, and if he starts asking you questions, we're going down the wrong road. <laughs> but, uh, Bobby, i I got I to gotta say this. I grew up... A lot of people know this. I've talked about it on some of the other stuff I've done for Ring of Honor. I was able to see the Indianapolis Wrestling Show. Uh, if, if I went up in my attic and I twiddled with the UHF antenna just right on Saturday nights, I had WTTV out of Bloomington, and that was one of the first wrestling shows I got to start watching along with the Tennessee Show, and I watched you when you worked for Bruiser, and I know you had many lucrative and happy years working for the wonderful and compassionate <coughs> Bruiser. And uh, tell, Indianapolis and Chicago were both great wrestling towns, especially Chicago. A lot of people don't remember how hot oh. Chicago was in the early 70s, and you were right in the middle of it. You, you, I'm surprised you're still living from, from those fans. <clears throat> well, you know, one time, the only time it would happen in my life, they shot at me in Chicago at the amphitheater. And <clears throat> I'll tell you about that as we go on. But, um, yeah, Indianapolis was, um, it wasn't really a great area. It was an area where you started or you finished. <laughs> no one went there to make money. It was like Kansas City. You either, you're either finishing up or you were starting out. You well, come in on a $20,000 Lincoln and leave on a $60,000 Greyhound. If! That's a one-way ticket, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, I lived there and I was um, born in Chicago. I was raised in Indianapolis since I was 15. So I got to work with the matches and I was 17 when I started carrying the ring and doing stuff like that. So that's how I got in the business. But no, you didn't go there to make money. We went there to, to either get a break or learn or something. Uh, but Indianapolis had a bad TV, Channel 4, but only half the city could get it, the south side. And the north side never got there. It just didn't reach there. And Saturday at 2 a.m. also is not a prime time slot. No, most of ours are close to 3 there. So <laughs> you got a guy watching TV that can't remember what he saw. It's like a promoter. So, uh, uh, Indianapolis didn't do that well, but Chicago, was starting to roll. It was just after uh, Fred Cole and Buddy Rogers era, and then Bruiser and Gagne and Snyder took over, and they got TV changed around, and boy, it really started taking off. And it was really, that was their biggest town, Chicago. And then Indianapolis got their TV changed around. And, and one of the greatest front men of all time, Bob Luce, matchmaker, general manager, matchmaker. Dan Zotto. Oh my God. If, if, if anybody gets a chance to see the Bob Luce Wrestling Classics that floated around, he did a cable show a number of years ago where he, the, the horrible uh, film to tape transfers, you know, with, with Bob's own commentary, which in its perverse way was entertaining. This guy was the epitome of a wrestling promoter, and Bob Luce was the... Or he'd be working at a state fair trying to worry in to see the half-naked women. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, come on in. And JoJo the Dogface Boy will be on in five minutes. That was his kid. And, and, and he would do the interviews also with Sam Miniker. A lot of times he'd do them for the stand-ups, especially for Chicago. But Bob Luce, yeah. locally in Chicago, was kind of a legend, but he was... Uh, you got to uh, tell me something about Bob Luce, because I never got to meet He was just like you saw him. He was bizarre. <laughs> He's not a bad guy. You know, I haven't talked to him for 30 years. I just had no reason to, but uh, he's a nice man, but he's just like that. I mean, this guy makes coffee nervous. I mean, this guy keeps moving and talking and jumps around. He's just that way. He left his house. His wife was a woman wrestler. He was sharing a lass. And he left the house and he used to take a ride and think about things. He drove the Toledo in the back. <laughs> really? For no reason, he drove the Toledo from Chicago. 300 miles. 600 mile trip for a, an outing. I didn't say what he's with. His commentary would be, wow, in the bloodbath, and Eric Dick the Bruiser, the Crusher, and wow, fans, I tell you, wow. They're always going to be pouring down the halls, so you didn't to the gutter, to the mayor's office, and yeah. this and then. 
the <laughs> blood ran through the streets like wine. And I, but I tell you, in Chicago, there was, it was a juice city. And, and what I can't understand from watching wrestling as I know it is, it's a tribute to the heels, Bockwinkle and Stevens and, and, and your self-management and the Blackjacks. Bruiser and Crusher would beat these guys in three falls. They'd beat them up for the first fall and pin them. Then they'd beat them up the second fall, get juice on them, and then the Bruiser and Crusher get disqualified. And then they'd beat them up and pin them in the third fall. And the heels never got any heat in the ring, but the fans were ready to kill them, and the cops were standing facing the fans with their backs to the ring to make sure nobody, like you said. And there were no cops. Those were any free. Uh, all the any things. Oh, they're at the mall police, you know. Yeah. Those <laughs> the and, uh, you know, we come out to the ring in Chicago, and they put the spotlight on you. Well, now you can't see the people. Now, here the cops. <laughs> so you're ducking and dodging all the way there. I remember my first time in Chicago. I was uh, managing a... Um, Black Jack Lanza, no, the Assassins, uh, against I forget who, and had this woman, and she'd come down the aisle, and she had a voodoo doll, and she'd shake it at me, <laughs> and had something else in this hand. She was a huge woman, okay? Um, kind of a little bit like Aunt Esther and Moose Choa. <laughs> so she'd come down the aisle with this doll. So I had enough of her. She would walk behind me and pull my hair all the time. I had enough of this one night. So I said, sit down. And she stood up and dropped me like Tyson. <laughs> and I rolled under the ring, and I'm holding my nose, my nose is bleeding, she's telling me to come out from under the ring. I said, no, and we're going to come out. But that was, that was Chicago. <coughs> it was, there was no corrals under the ring or rails or anything. People just, it was wild. Then one thing we had was a box we go against uh, Vern. Got a, oh. a simple finish. Um, Nick slams Vern, referee goes one, two, Vern puts his foot over the rope, I throw it back, referee goes three. Vern jumps up, he said, I had my foot over. The referee says, continue. But I'm hugging Nick. I'm in the apron. Drop kicks Nick in the back, in the meat, rub sandwich, I go to the floor, and Nick goes back, one, two, three. Yeah. As I jumped up, some fans said, I'll get him down, and he rested his hand on the kid's shoulder in front of him and fired down to the ring. Oh, my God. And I shot a woman in the chest, one in the arm, two in the neck and one in the thumb. But he never reached the ring. He got the ringside seats before that. And the article in the paper, it was about 1975, and it said, all the kids said, all I saw was orange. And the kid was deaf. And the guy would come back, but no one would say, I saw him do it. So he didn't arrest him. But they put police around him to watch him, the detectives. But he never did nothing again. Well, that was, that was the same thing as in Boston when Blackjack Mulligan got stabbed by that guy. The, the cops actually grilled him on the suit, threw him to the cops, and the cops just... Pfft, like, my suit was a referee. And you take the guy off my suit, he oh, can't yeah. see that. And I asked him, I said, what are you young those people for? You can't see him. He says, I hear somebody out there. <laughs> but he couldn't see. So this guy jumped in the ring, slashed Mulligan, uh, crossed the knee like that, and the Mulligan reached for him. He slashed his forearm, and Monsoon grabbed him and threw him out of the ring. And didn't know the guy had cut him. He saw oh my God. something. He never saw that. And about a week later, every time Mulligan touched his arm or his knee, uh, green pus would come out. Ugh. And the guy had taken the knife and soaked it in pig fat and infected it. Ugh. And that's what happened. They do that in Puerto Rico also. They piss on stuff too, right? To try to make an infection, you know. And their children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But a lot of times in those days, the cops were, were, were fans of marks in the worst sense of the word, where the cops weren't going to help the heels. You had to go out and make friends with them first. Oh, right? Always Please. thank you when you come back. Yes. Thank you very much, guys. To take everyone's hand. Some of the guys would come back. Hey, did you see that guy throw something at me? <laughs> you know, yeah, what's all? What are you going to do about it? You have to swipe for making 12 bucks a week. Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to watch your back the next time. Uh, the destroyer, Dick Byer, I learned from him in Louisiana. He came, came through Louisiana because he had Kitty Train and Mark Reagan, and he was going to work with him every night and get the kid over, and the, even though he, he was, had never been there in the past 15 years, or previous 15 years or whatever, and he never had any heat, he wasn't on television, he was a heel, and he knew what he was doing, he went out to those cops every night, hey, how you doing, big dick hurts, nice to meet you, put his arm around him, made friends with him, and then when he went out, they were nice to him. Okay, we, we were in Cleveland, Alanza and I, in the 60s, for Pedro Martinez. <clears throat> they had um, steel chairs, and they weren't padded, and they fold them, and they sit on my frisbees. And they we used to have to pull darts out of some of the guys' backs. They'd oh. throw everything. And we tell the cops, hey, a little protection. They say the promoter told us not to mess with the people. They paid to get in. <laughs> Cleveland was inventive with the, the kind of foreign objects they would throw. Because when Crockett started working for him, we were going to Cleveland. 
I'm used to ice cups and, and you know things like that, but rocks, batteries of, of shoes. Every time somebody throw a shoe at me, I grab it and throw it under the ring so they'd have to leave home, you know, one or leave go home with one shoe on. A Vaseline jar, full Vaseline jar, one time, whoosh, right over the head. It's Cleveland one night there having a lumberjack match. And I can't remember who it was, Terry Taylor and somebody. And everybody on the cards around the ring except me. I'm in the back. And Dusty wants me to go run in and whack Taylor with the racket and boom, run back out so the heel wins. And well, were you in with you and Will? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm back there, so I, I mean, you couldn't smarten the cops up then. So I went up to the cops and I said, you know, this match is, this match is just getting to me. I'm just getting so excited. I may not be able to contain myself in the next five to seven minutes. I may head to that ring. If I do, I sure hope somebody's with me. And sure enough, when I ran, boom, they, they ran with me. I got back. They got me right to the barricade at the back. And as soon as I stepped through the barricade, some guy standing there with his back to me had me with an elbow right in the stern. I walked up, said, if that hurt, I turned around. I thought it was a guard. It was a fan. He's taking off this way. So I ran, grabbed him by the, by the edge of the shirt, whacked him with the racket, which is where I figured out, don't use wooden rackets. Use metal ones. When I whacked him, the racket cover started rattling. I broke the frame of the racket yeah. and everything. <laughs> And then here comes Dennis Conner, grabs him and boom and off we go. But Cleveland, they would get inventive. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have a when we had a six-man tag. It was uh, myself, Buck Winkler, and Stevens. High fives and Larry Henderson. And they would throw so much stuff there. It was so bad. I just said, hey, let's go. Let's go back. So we went back to the dressing room. Joe Deucey came in. He said, hey, the match isn't over. So you go out there and work, Joe. Yeah. And you come out and stand in the corner with me. He said, well, you got to do something. If you go out there and tell him one more thing is thrown, evening is over. They don't get to see the end of the match. Everybody that paid will lose their money. There you go. They're the police themselves. They don't do anything. And the thing in Detroit, easy to stop. You put a cup in your head and put his back to the court, and look at the people. They can, the Secret Service don't watch the president. He's not going to jump at the people. <laughs> you can watch the people, right? <laughs> well, that, those, uh, you didn't work... I guess uh, you really didn't work for Jim Crockett Promotions much at all, did Never you? Never did. Never did. Be because those North and South Carolina spot shows, I mean, boom, North Carolina, because I'm carrying a tennis racket, right? It's a college town, a bunch of wise-ass kids. They brought buckets of tennis balls, and we're being pelted with tennis balls. So, and I mean, from, you know, a distance of 80 feet, sidearm low, some of them goes real, real good, you know, it catch you right away, it'll hurt. So, one of the Midnight Express standing on the apron of the ring watching the people while the other one works and then tag vice versa, but I'm out there on the floor and finally I said, wait a minute, I'm holding a tennis racket and they're throwing tennis balls. I started drilling those son of a bitches back at those people and they started throwing them or stopped throwing them pretty quick. See, but nowadays you have huge water. Oh yeah, now you get sued. I'm in Winnipeg one night and I'm standing in the apron and I'm in a match and a guy shoots me in the arm with an air rifle, pistol, and it hits me right there. And they say you never sell a mark. Don't put over anything he does. Yeah. So I'm standing holding on to this rope as I'm urinating into my boots. <laughs> <laughs> this thing hurt so bad and I couldn't move my arm. And back when it says, something wrong? And I said, no, Nick. I always pee my pants on Thursdays around 9.30. <laughs> you moron. Yeah, so you, you, know, you couldn't go, ow! Then the boom are too old. They used to get away with stuff. Not only was there a little bit stronger heat, but also it was, everybody wasn't so lawsuit happy. Because I mean, in, in Mid-South, working for Watts, I saw Watts one time, the cops would not stick the fans and they'd stack them up and their blood like psycho would be running down the wall from where they'd thrown these fans and they were going to get them later. They'll, they'll, they'll be there for a while. But Watts, actually, this guy jumped me. Grizzly Smith is pulling him by the hair and he's got me by the head and Bob Eaton's got the racket whacking the guy in the head but he's actually taking the skin off of Grizzly's knuckles and Watts just grabs the guy and throws him up against the wall and he's trying to hit him and the guy keeps ducking so he grabs his left arm and he slaps up against the wall and he says, here Jake, hold this, Grizz. And Grizz holds it and he drills him, boom, and he gets on his head and he's standing on his head. So you want to beat up my wrestlers, huh? And then the cops are standing there watching this. It's in Tulsa, so Watts is God. And then they grabbed the guy and they pulled him out by the feet and they dumped him out in the back alley and we never heard another word. Now there'd be $25 million lawsuits and the whole city would be involved. And hey, some guy came to my room in Chicago and some guy hit me in the head with a ball-peen hammer. <laughs> right here in the crown. Not a claw hammer. No. no it's a ball-peen hammer. So which it, are, everybody knows are more dangerous. As I brush my hair back, I see blood. And I said, ah, Jesus. We got the dress and the cops bring him up and they hold the guy against the wall. But where are the doors? So I, they said, go ahead, Bobby. So I took off at him. And just as I got there, Dusty Rowe kicked the guy in the groin, the guy went down, <laughs> and I hit the wall. Now my head's busted with my hands bleeding, and I told the cops, I said, get him out of here before he kills me. 
<laughs> we were in Richmond, Virginia one night. It was a four horseman match. And I was standing back watching it. It was on television even. <laughs> I don't know whether they ended up airing this, but they were beating up Dusty and one of the fans hit the ring and, and grabbed and had Arn, I think it was Arn Anderson. Yeah, I believe it was. No, it was J.J. Dillon. He had a J.J. Because Arn kicked one of the other. Point being, as the fan grabs uh, uh, J.J., Arn goes to kick him, but J.J.'s got his hand up there. Arn is up kicking J.J.'s hand and, like, breaking all his fingers, trying to kick the guy in the head. You do more damage to each other because oh, yeah. everybody's going after the guy at the same time. We had a guy in the hammer in the end when I was still town, you know. I used to pick on people and one guy come on this, but I wouldn't have to do that. But this guy's about five feet eight and has no neck. It starts here and goes to here. That little guy. <laughs> come on, get in here. <laughs> cop says he gets in on him. the cop off. Now, cop, another cop comes up and shoves him off. And he's got a cop on each arm and he curls the ring. I feel this. Oh my God. Well, Enzo says if he gets in here, he's all yours. Yeah. <laughs> you can't pick out one because then, and also then in the yeah. court, they'll say, well, you challenged him. But right. I, w I was at Ringside one time and it, I'd not even seen this guy before. And it was a spot show. It wasn't a hot, real hot match. I just happened to look around and the guy was yelling at me and I pointed right at him and said, you sit down. He stood up and I was like, oh, you're going to come over here? And some bitch he was. He comes right under the rope and I just had one of my knee surgeries. I had my, my knee brace on. I was still getting used to it. So I tried to take off and figure, you know, I'm going to catch him at least halfway coming. I tried to take off and my, my leg was, it was just there. It was planted. I was like, oh, shit, this ain't working yet. So we ended up just locking up. Now, he's got me. I tried to hit him with the racket. He's got my hands. I've got the racket. He can't let go of me or I'm going to hit him in the head, but I can't at the same time let go of the racket or he's got my racket. So we're in a stalemate, and i got no balance, and we're just standing there. It looked like we were dancing. You never hurt them, yeah. either. No, you can't hurt them. No, the guy, um, I was the first manager they ever used in St. Louis. They only had three cops there. So for a year I didn't do nothing, but I had a lot of heat just being there. Yeah. So finally they decided to do something one time. So I jump up, I'm just standing up one night, and a guy comes and he grabs my shoulder here. There were no rails then, so I whirl around and I hit the guy with a working punch. And the guy looks at me, <laughs> and he sits down and I heard him tell the woman next to him, he can't hurt anybody, he just gave me his best shot and never fell him. <laughs> You forget sometimes, don't you? Then I'm you... throwing the ring one night in, uh, in Gore, Indiana. Sherlock throws me out. And some old man gets up with a cane, and he walks up, and just as he goes, he kicks me in the groin and grabs his leg. So I go to kick him in the balls. And I kick, he turned, and I turn, and we crack knees. Now we're both going, he's going back to the chair, <laughs> I'm going back to the ring, like we're both 90 years old. And let him just says, get in here before you kill yourself. <laughs> but you never heard him. You never heard them guys anyway. And old women and old men are, are the most dangerous. The, the big guys are not as, as dangerous because the old men will cut you. And the old women, what can you do to them? I'm, I'm in Lubbock. And just stand there at the Fantastic Midnight Express. And this woman, I don't know what we did, grabs one of the chairs from the front row and raises it over her head. And she's coming at me. And I'm looking at her. And she's got to be 70. And she's barely 5 foot 3, gray, blue hair. And she can barely hold this chair up over her head. And she's going to hit me with it. And I'm trying to... Now, I don't want to get hit by the chair. What can I do to this woman? I can't, so I block the chair. When I block the chair, the force of her swing causes her to stumble and fall down. Now I'm standing there with a chair <laughs> over the body of the, the corpse of this woman who I haven't even touched who's fallen down and is having a stroke and the people are starting to stand up, grab chairs. I'm like, what can I fucking do? I can't win. If I hit the woman, uh, she's dead. She probably killed herself trying to hit me. I didn't touch her. They're still going to kill me. You just get yellow leaf. I was in Jonesboro, Arkansas in 1965. Oh. And that's when the blacks had to sit in the balcony. And they had white and colored drinking fountains and yep. bathrooms. And it wasn't an arena. It was like a place where they held um, chicken fights. It was, I think, who ran the town. Uh, his name was Dwayne Peel. Buddy Wayne. Yeah. Buddy Peel. Yep. Yeah, him and Herb Welch. <laughs> And you had to come back after each fall to they give you the finish. Yeah. Because they made three matches. And they exactly. no concession. <laughs> That's the truth. So they always told me, I'm just starting, I'm in business four months. They told me in the rings will work, outside to the shoot. You had a trouble in there, get in the ring. So Tommaso was working with Al Costello, hits him with a knee and Al takes a bump, he hits him in the in the thigh and Al's leg swells. And he can't walk. So 
we, we came, he was back to the dressing with the baby face side. We go back to ours. And when the guy Mitchell and Joe Tomasa, they were wearing masks because the assassins. I got a tuxedo on, a plastic rose, blonde hair, white sunglasses. It looked like Betty Austin is a legitimate kid. <laughs> and I'm sitting there when I got to run to shoot. That's over the heads of anybody under 35, and you know what? We don't care. <laughs> and uh, so now we come back up the third floor, and the finish was uh, Betty was going to take both of them on by himself, and finally they overbombed him, and they get disqualified. That was it. Simple. Now they both jump in the ring, they're fighting him, and now the people are really getting hot. So the guy's walking down the aisle with a chair. And I tell put that chair down. 20 years old, four months in the yeah. business. Put that chair down. No police. They're American Legion cops with the, with the old army helmets. They're about 80 years old. Because the American Legion got a 1.5%. Uh, yeah. yeah. And they sit there on their chairs. <coughs> and I say, Pop, there's a guy coming over the chair. And he said, uh-huh. <laughs> so I'm not moving no help here. So I rolled in the ring. Now the people think we're all in there together. So now they all come down. <laughs> so guys, the rest get out of here. So they both jump out of the ring, and I forgot to follow them. I try to get out, and the people are tipping the ring. I'm trying to step out, and I can't. So a guy comes back, and he grabs me, pulls me to the floor, and he puts his arms around me. As we start walking back, those old American Legion cops took their blackjacks out and were stabbing me on the head and on the back on the way to the dressing room. I worked a whole week from the Lewis, and I made $40. But <laughs> well, wait a minute. Hold on here. I'm in top, though. Okay. I was going to say. <laughs> Buddy Wayne, and, and I love Buddy Wayne. He's a, I know him to this day. He's a great story. He's the worst kid in the world. Well, I, when he was that age. Ken, when he was that age, oh, God, because I ended up managing Ken, Buddy's son. And Buddy looked like Jerry Clower, the country comedian for our country fans in the audience. His hair, and, and he had a battle with cancer, and, and he got through <clears> it, and he never lost any, his head. The most amazing head of hair I've ever seen. Buddy, at one time, Ken, his son, called him head because he was like 5'9 and about 320 or whatever, and he had a big head. But Ken's son in Osceola, Arkansas, one night, I was managing Ken and Danny Davis as, as the uh, the Galaxians. You know, don't even ask me where it came from. And this woman starts, this big corn-fed country woman, she's bigger than me at the time. I was 22 years old, probably about 195, 200 pounds maybe. She's got to be 220, about six foot two. She just gets up. She starts chasing me around the ring. The only thing I can think to do is run and roll in the ring like they told me, right? But she's faster than I am. So as I go to roll in the ring, she catches my feet. Now Ken grabs my hands. Now they're playing tug of war with me. And you know those Tennessee rings, the edge of the apron there, there's no holding. <laughs> they're raking me across this sharp edge of the ring, and Ken's pulling me in, and then she'll pull me back out. And Ken ain't much stronger, if any, than she is. So I'm going in and out, in and out, and I'm losing all this skin. And finally I said, what of you let go, because I need some relief. It, it about stretched me into a fucking rubber band. You say five now. I said, yes, it's very good. I stood up, but, you know. But, uh, but I used to tell Buddy when he promoted towns, I, I got him hot one time, because I mean, his, his towns were doomed to failure sometimes because he had the B show and he didn't get the top talent. If I would have been on it if he had top talent. And I told him, I said, Buddy, I said, your towns are the best kept secret in the business. I could enter the Federal Witness Protection Program and be in your main event, I'd still be safe. He got hot. He I got a good friend, Bill Howard. You know Bill Howard. Yes. And in Atlanta, you worked the same towns every week. Monday was Augusta, Tuesday was Macon, Wednesday was... Um, Columbus, Thursday was either Rome or uh, Athens, <clears throat> Friday was Atlanta, Saturday was TV in the morning, then Columbus, and Carrollton, Sunday was Marietta, and started over again. Yeah. But he didn't, bo they didn't book all the boys all the time. So everybody asked Bill Howard, what's his favorite town? He says, Marietta, it's only 20 miles away, but it takes me six weeks to get there. <laughs> <laughs> no one knew what that meant. Yeah. I always thought if guys changed their name to many others, they'd get a lot more bookings. Because many others on every wrestling card in history, right? So and so for so and so, so and so for so and so, plus many others. Remember Rick McGraw? Yes, quite well. He, he wanted to change his name to Rick Boring. He said, then the people that promoted it, here's the young Boring. He said, they think I was getting older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he used to, he was uh, uh, partners with Troy Graham. Jimmy Hart put them together in Memphis as the New York Dolls. And they were the, the, the first, uh, when the fabulous one, Stan Lane and Steve Kerr got together, they were the first program they had because they were wearing the top hats and tails and blah, blah, blah. But Rick was, he was always different, God bless him, he's dead now. But when he worked uh, uh, in the Pensacola Territory, he, he never even got a place to live, right? He'd just, he just check in on the beach, or just not check in, but he'd just live on the beach sure. and then go to the town. And that's a lot of the guys, the Fullers always ran short trip territories. If, if you ever, you worked at uh, Knoxville some, didn't you? Out no. of the land office, you never did? Mm, um, out of the land office, 
But when the seventy nine, no, we just were doing it. But when the when the Fullers they ran Knoxville, they ran a continental southeastern promotion mm -hmm. in in Alabama. The the theory was if you stay in, in Lake on the boat until five thirty and you come in in flip flops, get dressed, as long as you made it to the ring, but by the time your bell rang, you were okay. Sure. And then right back out and right back to the beach. Yeah, it's a little territory too. Yeah. Like John Madden when he had uh, <coughs> Sabers, his quarterback. You know the trouble he got into. <coughs> he said, "What was your team rules?" He said, I'm just glad to see him on Sunday. As long as someone showed up. Yeah. It was the only rule I had, show up. Well, that's an old rule in the wrestling business. If you're going to be late, be real late. Get there when, when the bell is ringing for your match because then they're, done, they're not mad. They're just we, had, to see we, it. we had to a town late one night, Von Rashke and I. It was Bruiser Town. So I said, what about time my train came by? Now, nah, tell me how to fly tire. We didn't know what to say. We got there. We walked in. Bruiser said, how come you're late? But Ashley said, well, I fight. <laughs> what, can what can you, you say? say? What can you say? That was it, yeah. No, but, uh, tell me a little bit about now when when you were in Indianapolis when you were managing at one time Von Raschke and Jimmy Valiant were, were partners, right? Before the invention of Luscious Johnny. That was my invention. Okay. I'll tell you how that happened. <clears throat> I was managing Valiant. And uh, I, I don't like the man at all. I, I've, he, I've heard there's heat. He's, um, He's, he just uses people, and uh, and Johnny's just as bad. And uh, my mother was in the hospital with a heart attack. I come to the hospital, and Johnny's there to see my mom. What a nice guy. He wasn't there to see my mom. He knew I was coming there. He needed a ride. He was there, he was there to get a ride. Yeah, that's just where the opera is. I have no, no time for any of them. But I was working for the Bear Man up in Canada, and I started to keep John L. Sullivan. He had long hair, looked like Jimmy. He had uh, the tights. Kind of had the same look. So I went back and told Bruiser, I said, I got a guy for you. This guy be perfect for the balance. I figured that way I wouldn't have to manage him anymore. I could go to Minneapolis <laughs> and they, he had his own tag team. So Bruiser, I could be, he, he kept me there another year. And finally I just uh, gave my notice and went to work for Vern up there because there, there was no money there. Well, I, I remember Von Reschke and, and Jimmy Bayan as a tag team. I, that was such a strange combination, but you worked the Chicago Comiskey Park show, one of them, uh, not the only one, but one of them, it was Bruiser and Bobo Brazil against you and the Sheik. Yeah. How the hell did you end up getting stuck in that spot where, because you had to do most of the work and no, the bumping I mean, and the running for that team? No, it was easy, because, you know, first of all, to me, the Sheik was the greatest heel ever in the business. Here's a man no, that, no doubt about it. a man that drew money for 40 years and never did yeah. an interview. Exactly. Never if he had taken an arm drag or a bumps or a back drop, he'd have been like any other guy with a turban. But he, he was first hardcore. He was first with screwdrivers and the fire and everything. And you never knew what he was going to do. He drew money. He and people believed it too. Yes. He scared people. And I met him when I was 17 years old. <coughs> and I used to watch his car. He'd give me uh, five bucks to watch his car. That was a lot of money when I was 17. Yeah. I was 61. No, I'm not making I don't pay five bucks for the guy to wash my car now. No, watch it, not wash it. Oh, I thought, I'm sorry. No, after my no, watch it. Fuck you, you're on your own. Hey, if you're the one who messed with I don't know what I do with 17. I'm letting this happen to it. I'm shooting the horn. What are they going to do? I'm 17 years old. I'm a coward. Toot, toot, cheating. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, I'm not going to ask him. I said, what do you want to do in the match? He says, you stay with Bruiser, I stay with Bobo. It's okay. And well, it, so see, I, at the beginning of the match, I've seen the film of the match, and, and you got your you, you got run around the ring, you got your ass bumped off, and she could come in, stick somebody with a pencil, and then run. Right. <laughs> yeah. But at the beginning of the match, I wanted to borrow Bruce's band from. He was going to be the last one out to the ring, right? Yeah. So when I saw him coming, I jumped out of the ring and ran to center field. So we told the cops to go and get me, but they couldn't catch me. So I ran around. I said, "Don't catch me. You don't want, you don't want you to catch me." So they were working with me, but he wanted them to catch me. <laughs> and I was so blown up. I. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that was fun because uh, to be there in so, uh, Comiskey Park with the Sheik and Bobo, who I really admired, was a great guy. And uh, I there were three guys in the match that I liked: Sheik, yeah. Bobo, and me. Yeah. And, uh, what about the referee? Hey, it was the only other referee, and they were hard. They were commission guys. Oh, the the. the it, it was, a lot of the commissions would treat it like a shoot. I mean, New York State, even in the 80s, was that way. You always had to have commission referees instead of the regular guys that worked with you. And they didn't know. It was political. Come here from Sikkim. Yeah, they were just there to get paid. I'd rather they got paid and then just sat there and did nothing and let the good referees run. Well, first of all, a commission has nothing to do with running a wrestling show. A commission is, main, is there so the state that they're in gets their tax money. Right. That's all. They can stop a show, not from wrestling. The only way they can stop it 
is they can call the state police and, and they'll confiscate your box office. Exactly. So that's why yeah. they put up with them. But they can still run the show. They can't stop that, but they'll take your box office. The athletic commissions predominantly, and I'd say there's probably a, a several well-meaning commissioners, but predominantly athletic commissions were to tax wrestling so that they could regulate boxing because they were more boxing fans than wrestling fans. A lot of them liked wrestling, but they, they, they didn't do anything really to help, uh, especially in the Midwest and the North. They didn't yeah. do anything to help the business. They'd take your 5% or 7% or whatever it was and make everybody get licensed and check your blood pressure. Okay, if you, if you got blood pressure, a pulse, and, and you got breath, they'll hold a mirror up in your face. I had the same guy every week. Yeah. 144 over 9. Everybody was 144 over 9. <laughs> I don't give a guy with 800 pounds or a midget, 144 over 90. So he was, uh, he was done with the last guy. Hey, Doc, the guy just got his ear ripped up. No, doctor, he's gone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they gone. take the blood pressure and they're gone. Yeah, but uh, there was a lot of corruption there. In, now, in the with, with, with Sheik also, you were on the bruiser side. You weren't on bruiser side, but you were on the bruiser side of the promotional war in Detroit until they made up, right? Yeah. And that, uh, they were doing big business at the Olympia and at Kobo. No, we weren't doing good business. Really? I, I, thought, I thought both of them for a while were doing well. No. We, um... Kobo was doing great. Well, yeah, he, 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 got, he uh, had everybody from the NWA in there. Yeah. And, uh, the Olympia was a bigger place. And it was a bad neighborhood. But well, now, when you say you were doing bad, how many people for a show? Oh. We were doing, like, maybe 20 grand. Well, okay. Dollars. 20 grand, let's say that's uh, at the, in those prices, that's three, four, th three, four thousand people. Yeah, in a building at home, okay, about 18, bad. Three, but three or four thousand people now, you can't do it. You run out of town twice a year. No, but a major town like that, and the TV we were on, CKLW, you should have been yeah. selling the place out. And Sheik was doing it. He was selling out of Fobo. He was doing it. There were 11,000 people. But there, was, there were 40 people on the card. There was 14 matches. Terry Funk and Dory Funk Jr. were in the second match against uh, Sheik and yeah, the Yeah, we all he made so, so. Yeah, and he just in and out, just blow him out of the water. He was trying to get from the Olympia to the hotel, and then the matches were. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if, you, if you took the gate from, from the Kobo, sold out, and divided it up amongst every big name on that card, 40 names, everybody was probably getting 100 bucks. But, it, but he ended up winning the war. You know, why, you know why there was that war? What started it? I'll tell you what happened. Bruiser worked in a gimmick with Alex Harris. Okay. And he was supposed to get in a fight with Alex in the bar and they had a cop set up to arrest him. Bruiser didn't want to do the angle. Harris didn't like wrestling. He wanted to do it because of Detroit. Right. And Bruiser got there, it was his day off, and Barnett was the promoter. And the guy behind the bar said, whatever you do when you're in the fight, don't break the TV. That's Alex's favorite. <laughs> so now Alex don't show up, Bruiser's man. So Bruiser takes a pool cue and runs it through the TV. So now they, the, the cops come and they call, they call the real cops. And they come and they beat the hell out of them, handcuff them, and took them to jail. And during the fight, I guess Dick broke a cop's arm and hurt one's back. And Barnett never stuck up for him in those lawsuits. And then Barnett turned around and he sold the territory to the Sheik. You know how much he sold it to him for? Our 20 grand? 50 something. grand. 50. And Barnett told me that she paid him $1,000 a week for a year. Because Bruiser never paid Barnett for Indianapolis, but she paid Barnett for Detroit, right? Right, and Indianapolis was part of Detroit. But Bruiser had the TV in Detroit. Because yeah. after, after they dropped the seat, when Barnett and Doyle left, she had, she had, look at the towns he had. It's Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, Detroit, all the Michigan towns, all the Ohio towns, yeah. Honeywood, Virginia, Louisville, um, and Indianapolis. And so Bruiser, because Bruiser was from there, had his TV in Indy, and he was more powerful in Indy yeah. than he would have been. When, when Barnett himself. left to run Australia and Johnny Doyle, then it just, everything kind of splintered because Sheik had more power in Detroit, Bruiser had more power in Indianapolis. And Bruiser had left, remember Louisville, I heard this story from actually people that were there at the time. Uh, Bruiser had left Louisville and Evansville sitting for like seven years. He just got a booking fee from Jared. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but the way it happened is, is when, when Jared expanded, uh, actually, Christine got the TVs up there. Jared was booking that in for Nick at the time. But when they when they opened up Louisville and Evansville, they, they didn't pay Bruiser a booking fee at first. And Bruiser and Snyder went down and personally spoke to him one night in Evansville. And from then on, they got 5% for like years. Yeah. Whatever. Well, see, and um, with, with Detroit, that's what Bruiser was mad about. 
that Vern, uh, uh, that J uh, Jim Barnett sold the territory to the sheet and not him. And he owed them for all the uh, oil bills and everything. So that Bru Bruiser said, I'm just going to go get Detroit. It was nothing personal with him and yeah. the sheet. He just wanted Detroit. And they made up and they did they did real good business yeah. in both places later on when they had the cage matches. And then I, and, and I turned babyface one time. I remember that. Against the sheet uh, in Indianapolis. We had the second show at Marcus Square Arena. And Bruiser gave me 600 bucks. You need to shoot two grand. That's, uh, when, that's when I quit and said I'm going to Minneapolis. Yeah. He said, go ahead if you think you can. But I remember that. I remember the TV leading up to that, too. And also, I remember also, at the time, gosh, it was, she had, had just come in. I think you might have been, a, well, whatever. But anyway, you were doing the thing where it was going to be uh, Miniker and Bruiser against you. And, and was it Sheik? I, was, your, was your partner there? Oh, Rad. Only Rad or Sheik. I forget. But it was right at the end of your run there. That's yeah. what. That's where I stole, appropriated, confiscated, or otherwise uh, researched the famous phone book tear. <laughs> I, I did it on Atlanta TV ten years later. When you came out, I said, "I'm going to rip this phone book and have it." Get three pages. There we go. And you tried to break the brick to show because Miniker was a karate expert. You know how he used to bake that brick? He put it in the oven and bake it. <laughs> think, think it was brittle like old teeth. <laughs> you know, like that would crumble. <laughs> and you'd hit it, and you'd sell your hand, and you'd try to throw the phone book, and it wouldn't work, and all that stuff. I loved it. And then you had the judo jacket match, which I was there for live. That was that was actually either the first or second Indianapolis show I saw when I was like 14. And I had my hand wrapped, and I bought some ether. And the doctor was the buddy, my buddy I started in the business. His name was uh, Dr. Uh, Carl K. Faven. <laughs> and the other doctor I had there was Dr. S.T. Bernard, St. Bernard. <laughs> He had a big tongue. So that's the names I gave him. So in, he had a doctor's bag. All he had in there was a can opener and a bottle of beer and ether. So, <laughs> so I, I, I got the ether and I poured it over my hand and it was gauze. And then I, people would smell all over the place. And then I put it on Sam's face and Sam went out. And that was the, the ether match. I, I became the ether bunny about 10 years later. We used the ether. And, and it's so corny. It's so ridiculous at this point. And that wasn't even real doctor's ether. Now, because I don't think... They'll even let you use that. No, I don't think it was easy either. It's, uh, but but the engine Hands starting fluid, well, engine starting fluid, but in the spray can has an ether base, and you can smell the ether smell. So I go out and get the engine starting fluid at, at you know Pep Boys Auto Center or whatever, and tape it up like it was some secret concoction, and I spray it on the rag. People would come. I would have to use that can to hit the fans because as silly as it was. The idea of putting ether on a baby face got them. To, they would come. They would come after you. And one night we, we sprayed it and I put it on. And I was always careful when I sprayed on the towel. You don't want to kill anybody. That shit would really mess you up. I would, as I threw the can down, I would fold the dry part of the towel that I had in my hand over the wet part. Well, one night in Jackson, Mississippi, with Tommy Rogers, I got a little over anxious because the the top had fallen off the sprayer or whatever. I had to get it, so I sprayed the towel and I folded the wrong part. I put it right over it, and now they've been going 20 minutes, and he's sucking wind. All of a sudden, now, he's sucking his engine starting fluid down his throat, and he he didn't. I don't know if he really went out, but he was puking and he was foaming. He, oh God, it looked hard, terrible. We win the match. We get in the back. They bring him out. And he's got to get some fresh air. It's middle of summertime, Jackson, Mississippi, not air conditioned, right? So they bring him, they lay him out by the back door, and all the fans are standing around in the back watching, and he's actually heaving. He's puking. He's got foam coming out, <laughs> and we're trying to get out of there before we have any trouble, so we've got our bags, and we walk over him and step <laughs> over him and run away the car, and then make the fans hot. Here they come, and they start throwing shit, rocks at the car and everything. You know, good bastard, you put the guy with ether and then step over his body. Well, uh, I used to spray the back of <laughs> You know, then put it this way. Uh, well, see, I, I wasn't smart enough. To, well, actually, I guess I was a smart person. Well, I was going to do it instead of... Sam was 80. Thing. He was on me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the things you do, it was, uh, it was really funny. I remember one night, I had the next right? Bar of soap tape. And... If it wasn't for hotel room soap, a heel could never want to match. No, no. <laughs> and I had a throw to lens in the ring one night, and walked was chasing me in the floor. So I, I threw it. Uh, Willie Mays. <laughs> and I saw Lanza go. <laughs> and the guy in the front row goes, No, what am I going to do? Yeah. I said, Don't you dare show that to the referee. That's the first <laughs> thing the morning did. He gave it to the ref. Ah. Thank God. Brilliant. Or he said, Ivory. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat>
When I first started a business, I was supposed to throw a chain in a cage match. To one of the, my assassins were Roger Smith and Donnie Bass, because Guy Mitchell and, and Tommaso weren't available. <laughs> and so they're working with the fabulous ones. And Roger told me that when you throw me the chain, throw it way up over the top of the cage like that, so everybody sees it and come right in my hands, right? So sure enough, boom, 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 and he's calling for it. And I throw it way up like that. It's in Nashville, Tennessee. And he looks up like that, and all of a sudden you hear, clink, clink, the ring lights. It hung right on the ring lights, and it's hanging there dangling. He's no way he can get it. As he's looking up, Kern just gives him a flipper for him and a chin, knocks him out the pants. But that's great. Oh, uh, yeah, people, they see me. And then but you go back to the dressing room, and you go ahead. That finish is screwed up. <laughs> they don't know it. And they, were, they weren't in on the They don't know the finish. No, no. no. So they don't know if it's screwed up. I mean, we do. You it's know, not important. Well, I tell the guys at OVW, I say the way that the people know when you, when you screw something up is, is when they see this look on your face. Then they know something's messed up. If you don't go, then they don't know. Right. It could have been anything. I, I want to say to you, because I never have gotten a chance to, this is the, my favorite guy in the business for a manager. <laughs> I mean, he looks like a guy that would manage you. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Would you let Fuji manage you? Actually, no. <laughs> would you let Alabama I would, rubber bands in I would, I would. I would want a manager with command of the English language. Would you let Blassie, <laughs> an 80-year-old guy in a suit, dress up like a nickel? <laughs> <laughs> would you let Select? <laughs> would you let Jimmy Hart? You can't see his eyes. Yeah. He looks like a barber outside yeah. of a barber shop. But you look like a manager. And I tried to work like a man, a, a wrestler like a manager, and manage like a wrestler. But you always had the suit and tie, and you get the glasses, and you had a tennis racket, and you never missed a word on in an interview. I thump her. I could talk her too fast, and I, I lose track sometimes. But this man never did. A tremendous command of the language. You knew where you were coming from at the start of the interview, towards the end. If a guy, a, the hardest guy to do an interview with, and you did, was David Crockett. Oh, Jesus. And you would get around him and shut him up. And I mean it, I mean it, my friend. Thank you, you very much. You, I always liked your work. Well, I really did. Well, I liked your work so much, I stole a great deal of it. So <laughs> I didn't invent the hammer lock. <laughs> I would use it. Yeah, but, but, well, that's the thing is, I've, I just figured out four, I like words. So I figured out four or five different ways to say the same thing. So it wasn't that I was saying a, a lot of good stuff. It just I was saying the same thing over and over, but it sounded different. But. Um, with, with with you as well as a manager, <clears throat> the one thing I was not able to do, and you know, I, I, got my, I got my ass kicked pretty well because they just knocked me down and I fall down. That's pretty simple, but you were able to work better than the guys that you managed. And and that saved a lot of questionable matches in a lot of instances. It was my gimmick. Had I been on worker, I couldn't stand territories that long. Exactly. This way, I made the main event money. And I could stay there. I stayed in Minneapolis for 13 years. <laughs> and they just feed me guys. Exactly. And that was it. But if I was a worker, I would have made good money for a year or two, and I had to go someplace. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And I didn't want to put my mother and grandmother around the country because I was taking care of them. Well, I mean, you know, you managed Ray Stevens, and you managed Nick Bockwinkle, who was tremendous talent. That was great. Uh, but, but at the same time, you also you managed some people that you had to save in, in a, lot mm -hmm. of, uh, a lot of matches. I don't mean save in terms of physically, but I mean save in terms of, of save entertainment, match, value, yeah. entertainment value. Well, and that's what I never understood, but the way they treat us. Are you managing or working? Yeah. What do you mean? Same thing. The only reason you're a wrestler is because that's your role you play. The referee, a wrestler, a manager has the same job as everybody. <clears throat> I probably drew more money than a lot of guys on the card. People pay to see me get bloody and bumping around. But they said because you weren't working, you weren't in the ring working. Yeah. Right? I mean, I mean, bring me in at the end for five minutes and have me drop a court. Yeah. So I mean, but that was a way of not having to pay. Well, and and that's something also is is and, and I know I'm hearing whispering from over there, so we're probably gonna have to take a break for tape. But I gotta say two things. One real quick is that a lot of times they see wrestlers up and down the card. The fans see the wrestlers take drop kicks and back drops and hip tosses, and they get to see them get punched in the face and everything. So that by the time the main event comes. You've pretty well seen a lot of wrestlers take a lot of bumps and getting beat up, but when the manager, who has a lot of heat, finally gets his come up as from the baby face, that's one of the highlights of the night, and that's what sometimes they come and pay to see. I don't, You're right. I don't know whether if I hadn't been dressed in a dress or whatever for Bill Watts, maybe the last stampede might not have done quite so well. I don't know because they had that carrot at the end of the stick. Sure. Uh, I'll say one more thing before they got to shut the tape off. 
the first time I ever heard the story that you told in your book was from Jerry Lawler because he he told me the story. He said when you finally went to smart your mother up, oh, yeah. smart her up to the business. She said, "Mom, the business however you said was a work." And she said, "Well, of course I knew that. You think I think I didn't know that?" Yeah. She said, "Nobody with the right mind will let you manage them." Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that right there yeah, yeah. it all. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> they don't even know we left. I, actually, I went down the hall with this microphone still attached to my tie, and one of the maids said, I didn't know we were still shooting those kind of videos here in this hotel. <laughs> <laughs> who was it Who was it that took, they had a wireless microphone on a live broadcast, this was like 15 years ago or whatever, and, and they didn't realize it was still on, and they were still wearing it, and it went they piss. Oakland. That's right, that really was Gene Oakland. <laughs> no, it, it was me. <clears throat> Oakland is another story I can't tell. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it was me. I it was at uh, WWF, and Vince and his wife Linda had some guests there in the studio. So I saw Larry Rose, and I said, leave my mic on. <clears throat> so I went in the bathroom, and I flushed it, and you could hear it. And I said, oh, come on, big fella. Come on. <laughs> okay, come on. Back in the holster. Ah, let's go. I'm back in the studio, and Vince is there like this. <laughs> And he said, turn your mic off. <laughs> Did I have that on? <laughs> I, I, I was watching the night, and it was, I try not to admit this, but I did used to have occasion to sometimes watch the WCW programming. I'll admit it. I'm a closet WCW watcher. Didn't like a lot of it, but watch it. But the night was Pillman. I know you didn't mean to, and he had the bad neck, and, but but it was to me that was great live television because it, just, it didn't hurt you a bit as far as your image, but it got Pillman over as a nut. What happened was, you see, my student told me, when you're doing color or play by play or anything, you don't call what's going on in the ring. You call what's on the monitor. Because then if you're shooting something, you're not calling. Yeah. So I'm watching the monitor, and they both spell out of the ring. Uh, they were shooting the other two. I don't see Pillman coming around. And I, I had a broken neck. I had my neck. I, I broke my neck in 83 in Japan. I didn't have an operating on until 94 or 5. 95, I think because I didn't have insurance. But I did it turn. So he, everybody knows this. I got a bad neck. So he came behind me, and I didn't see him. I watched him under. He pulled my coat down on my shoulders. And I said, what the F? <laughs> and I threw my headset down, and I saw it was Pillman. And I started to walk out of there, and then I started working. And I got mad, and he yeah. came back. And, and then they came up to me afterwards. I came up to them and told them I'm sorry. They didn't even know it. They were so <laughs> done here, I told Bishop, you said that? I wasn't listening. They oh, never know it. They have, have you done anywhere? We're doing night for one night, and they bring over the TV. Eric Bischoff tells the audience that the Raw show this week is taped, and Mick Foley wins the belt. Yes. In his genius mind, thinking the people will stay with us. <laughs> He has told them what to watch. Yeah. You're going to see a world championship change hands on the other station, folks. You don't want to see that. But this is right. Yeah. We, got, we, we got Nitro Girls in Disco Inferno. Yeah. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> so we're bringing this big monitor. Eric wants to watch the Raw show, right? So I'm sitting there, and I'm doing color. And I'm watching their monitor. I'm calling Owen Hart smash. And I don't think anybody ever knew it. Then I realized, what was Owen Hart? I said, what am I doing? And then I realized I'm watching the wrong monitor. They both things. You see, well, now, now I know why Bishop was such a good announcer because he was watching the wrong program instead of the one he was supposed to be calling. He's trying to watch the other guys. Oh, they had this one girl in the production car. <laughs> She'd bring up the uh, format. Maybe after the second match. <laughs> and I told you, sometimes it, they weren't ready, and she would put the staple. Now, if you're going to have a format, three pieces of paper, we put the staple. Upper left hand. She'd put it upper right hand or lower right hand. You couldn't. She was just so stupid. She was the <laughs> dumbest woman I'd ever seen. She weighed about 400 pounds on a hoof. <laughs> and she was a diabetic. So she would inject her carcass with a needle in the morning, through her jeans at the airport. She'd go right through, bang, bang, and then she'd lay on the floor and eat, um, those potatoes like nuggets. Oh, tater tots. Tater tots on the floor. And she's laying there one day, 
aan haar zij met die sneeuws sticken aan haar kiester, die de potato zijn. En some old man sitting on the bench next to me, waiting to board the plane, and he looks at that. I said, you should have been here earlier. I said, usually after they stun him with that, they cut the tusk right off. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. That's what I kind of think we were working with. I bet she looked natural in Cal. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, we never worked the same place. As a no. matter of fact, I'm no. thinking about it. Except, except for, but not at the same time, except for that one brief period. No, and I was thinking it. about it on the way up here. Not only did we never work in the same place at the same time, except for when I started with Vince and I did my first Raw, you were the, the, the color man, and we got to do that one interview and a couple of things, and you were gone, and I was there, and you went to the place that I had been. But we actually didn't even work for a lot of the same promoters because I never worked for Vern, and I, I never got to work for Bruiser. You did. You never worked for Crockett. I did. Did you ever work for Fritz? Yes. I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't remember that. But I just went in for uh, two weeks as a wrestler. Yeah. Just, just to hang around with Lenz and Morgan and Patera. There you go. To go down for a week and drink. I remember <coughs> Nick and Aguera, <coughs> a condo in Florida. So after about a year, he says, um, it has to be painted. He's married. I wouldn't marry at the time. He said, you want to get on paint? I said, yeah, I'll get on paint. So Ray Stevens said, I'm going to Amarillo. He wants you to come to Amarillo. We'll go hunting. I don't hunt. I had more fun with Ray drinking than I would hang yeah. at all. <laughs> so I went to Texas with Ray. So about two days later, Bachman calls my mother. He says, can I speak to the brain? She says, you're speaking to him. If you want to touch to the asshole, he's in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down to Texas to work for the fine for a couple weeks, and I wanted to work for Fritz. But that's how I was going to Did you ever work for Bullock? No. It's, it, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like we could have avoided each other any better if we had, had planned it that way. The reason I didn't, I worked for Paul in Houston. It, yeah, exactly. But the reason I didn't work for um, Watts or Crockett was because I don't want to work every day. I do want to work every day. Yeah. New, in New York, you had to, but then you'd have a week or two. You know, you'd work 10 days, off three, I'm back four, off three. But some of those days I was in Baltimore doing prime time and stuff, so... Um, but Vern, you don't work every day in Minneapolis, and you didn't work every day in Indianapolis. They didn't have the time. You do TV, yeah. interviews, you do four markets. Well, Nick Bockwinkle, when he was coming up to the business <clears throat> to work with Lawler, when he was AWA champion, you know, I was just starting the business uh, in 82 when he was, you'd, you'd come down with him when they first started acknowledging the title in 78, 79, and then I don't think he came back for a year or two, and then he started coming back, and he had that run in 82, 83. So I was lucky enough to be able to give him a ride a, a few times where he could be coming in as a courtesy, you know, and I lived in Louisville, so instead of him having to go back to Nashville with all the other guys, he'd stay over and uh, I went to Kingfish or whatever and then take him to Evansville. The same thing for Patera, Jesse Ventura, so I'm like sitting there going, so tell me, so-and-so, and I'll just drive and listen to stories. But uh, Nick said, oh yeah, for Vern, you work 17, 18 times a month. And I'm thinking, like, we got three days off a month, and I thought that was, you know, uh, normal. I'm going, holy mackerel. But you, you'd work about 20 times a month, you know, and, and you, you, most of the places you flew. And it was a big spread out territory. Yeah, so we you had, you had, you had San Francisco, uh, uh, Salt Lake, Nebraska, Minneapolis. You had Winnipeg 500 miles into Canada. Then you'd have uh, Wisconsin, Illinois. Um, and then I would go out up to St. Louis. With uh, Owens at some time, some, I managed Alfred Hayes there and Harley there. Then I go to Houston with Nick, and but no, we were never in the same territory together. Yeah, it, yeah. It, well, at least at least that way we got a chance to get this one more payoff from these suckers. For, for <laughs> one more? Oh gosh! <laughs> I guess I got my notice. Huh? <laughs> now, this is a, this is a heck of an organization. They're gonna do good. They are. They're going to do good. As soon as they they get, found some for me to do on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just get rid of that Sapolsky character. They, do me a favor. Tell me. I, I never got a chance to spend a lot of time around Ray Stevens. I had one time where he, he came out to uh, Las Vegas with Wally Carbo for that ladies group that I was doing color for, which was a, a reason for Ray to get paid off as an agent. No, he came no, right? up with Wally for one reason. That was to invest with Wally for Prince. Well, yeah. <laughs> But we got diverted our flight back to Charlotte because he was living with Wahoo at the time. We were both living in Charlotte. 
and we got diverted to Atlanta, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, we said, it's, it's weather, you know, it's just rain, instead of sitting here in Atlanta all night, let's get a car, let's go to Charlotte. Okay, so I got a ride with Ray Stevens, four hours, Atlanta to Charlotte. He told me more funny stories about when he was partners with Don Fargo in the 50s in San Francisco, or Roy Sharon, et cetera. Tell me some more Ray Stevens stuff, because, you know, his, his, his first wife was a woman wrestler. Therese Tice, right? Yeah, and she kind of works a little bit like uh, Luthez and Chief Strongbow. <laughs> <laughs> Tough woman. And she's about 10, 15 years older than Ray. And I said, aren't you ever scared of her? He says, I have her on her knees twice a week begging. I said, did you hit her? He said, no, she's telling me to come out from under the bed and fight like a man. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm out for a loaf of bread once. I was gone two weeks. <laughs> I said, what did she say when you get home? She said, where's the bread? <laughs> But that's how he was. He didn't care about anything. He he he. His first six path. lives went through six fortunes, right? <laughs> Not a week. Yeah. <laughs> His first path, the cow palace, when Shire took over, they sold out. It was enormous. First seller ever. Ray took his pay. I was three grand, I think it was. 1961 or something, right? right? Yeah. Gave it on the boys underneath on the card. He he was a tremendous guy and, and yeah. the best worker in, in the business. Him and Patterson. Him and Patterson. Because before it was the Shawn Michaels bump, it was the Ric Flair bump. Before it was the Ric Flair bump, it was the Ray Stevens bump. Um, and he and Patterson, you know, you had San Francisco is a big city, and you had the, two of the greatest workers in the business having that program. But then even after the motorcycle wreck and he broke his leg and he'd been in the business 20 years, and still in the AWA when you were, were managing him, he was still without hardly frying. Uh, ahead yeah. of most everybody else. And he's telling me, he get, he, people be quiet. He get the guy down and he said, I'm to shift gears. He started choking. All of a sudden, had hair start flying. And he started choking his eyes to get wilder. And the people start coming up. And he just, he had it. He had it. He was like Murdoch. He was, he was so natural. Murdoch was one of the best workers his business ever had. But he wanted to be Carl Cuff. Yeah, there you go. And he was the, one of the best hands ever. He was a tremendous worker. He should have been world champion. That's Pat O'Connor how come he didn't ever give Stevens a belt? He said, well, he didn't have the body for it. I said, well, you can ask him, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but, uh, no, it was, uh, that, that belt was a political thing, you know how that Oh, yeah. Have, so. Well, explain to me the first thing in wrestling that isn't political, really, when you think about it. <laughs> the Fed girl driving to the airport. And they, <laughs> <laughs> She's just there. Totally bipartisan. Um, <laughs> With Stevens and Bachwinkle, they were such uh, different personalities. Oh, yeah. How, how, I mean, I, obviously they didn't have to live together 24 hours a day, but they were tag team partners. Oh, but who, but who, which went, whose way? What? Nick made sure Ray was there. <laughs> but then Ray paid no attention to him. Rick was like a Captain Chipmunk. He was like a head of a bunch of Boy Scout team. He had the airport. Everybody, everybody was fine. I don't know why. They just wanted to be Captain Chipmunk. So... And Nick is very intelligent, he thinks. And he is, he's smarter than me, and he uses big words, but no one knows what they mean. <laughs> so he's trying to get away with the interpretation. Yeah, we're writing in calm days, so he's talking about um, paradox. He said, you know what paradox is? I said, yes, we put two boats. <laughs> Stephen says, no, two long dogs. <laughs> I said, no, it's two brain surgeons. <laughs> So we drive about another 50 miles. Nick says, have you guys been reading about the egg deficit they're having in Guam? Stephen turns around and says, hey, asshole, we're still working on <laughs> paradox. paradox. <laughs> I, I was doing the OVW TV show a couple months ago, and I, I just I like to mess with Dean Hill, who's a guy that does color with me. He was a former local police officer, and, and he was a member of the SWAT team, tough son of a gun. I don't let him get in any angles because Everybody in town knows he could stretch anybody or beat anybody up. He'd go into SWAT mode, right? So he stays over there. But we come back from a VTR of something or other, and I said, Dean, frankly, the dichotomy of the conundrum that we're currently perplexed with leaves me grasping for similes. And he just went, and I said, we'll be right back. He said, what the hell did you just say? I said, actually, nobody knows what I just said, and I'm not really sure I know, but I got a little bit better feeling for it than they do, so they just went about there. I just want to see if I can make you smile. Oh, yeah, we would do interviews sometimes, and Nick would start just talking, talking, and Ray would stop and say, the hell are you talking about? Is this a match we're having? <laughs> and then we'd read it. You know, it was good that way. It, we didn't understand. I'm from Beverly Hills, right? Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Right? I, don't, I don't understand it. We're doing good. Now, you're from Beverly Hills, but you never worked in Los Angeles territory, did you? 
Yeah. I'm not from Beverly Hills. I'm from <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. You know, I never went to Beverly Hills. And it was one of the first ones that closed down anyway. Yeah, but it was a, <laughs> was a territory where it, it was a long ways away. Yeah. And uh, Roy Shires wanted me to be Booker up in uh, San Francisco one time. But Roy did a lot of yelling. And I didn't want to move that far. And I had my mother to take care of all those years. And uh, then after that, I got married and had a baby right away. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to travel. I wasn't. Well, really, San Francisco was one of those places, also, where it wasn't really a territory as much as it was the city with spot shows, and you could That's live right. a short trip territory where you could make some good money, but That's right. not hey. like Dallas. When well, we excuse me for Fritz, we just come up working for Watts, where we had a big year as one that that, that kind of made us. And we go to work for for world class and Von Erichs. And if you didn't work with the Von Erichs, you weren't figured into the top pay spot. So we looked at kind of okay, we're averaging a thousand dollars a week, but we only work four or five times, and most of the trips are short. And and we're living in Dallas, Texas, and the weather is good. So, but after about six months of a paid vacation, you want to get out there and and, and actually get figured in again, so you yeah. can accomplish something. Yeah, I remember guys just say. Uh Great territory, a lot of days off. The guys don't, don't want days off. Because the guys get a day off, they figure they're not going to be figured in. Yeah. That's the way it is. But some places, I just didn't want to work every day. San Francisco well, you wouldn't were, work every day, but I didn't want to go that far. With, with Minneapolis, you had your cake and you ate it too because they didn't work a full schedule, but you were still figured in and you could accomplish something. Right, and I lived in Indianapolis. Yeah. And uh, I, one of the shots I finished up in Chicago, it was 200 miles, and I'd leave my car at the airport or something. And it, it wasn't bad. Then I moved to Minneapolis, and I lived there for a few years. But it was good. It was just so damn cool. See, now I like days off. I like more days off than days on now. But when I was in my younger days, I, you know, that's one of the reasons why we didn't like, we didn't really enjoy working in Dallas because you were on the card and you're having okay matches and you're featured on television, you're making a check, but you weren't making a difference in the house. You weren't figured in. You weren't able to accomplish what you knew you could if they'd give you the ball that you run with it. Mm -hmm. So then we went and exactly reverse again we went right back from from Watts to Fritz where we had plenty of time off and then eh, right to Crockett where holy shit we're working every day but at least we, they're giving us the ball and we run with it and we do our stuff yeah you know well, see Minneapolis it was so easy it was only a handful of guys yeah and, and, and like, Nick was a champion you had the tag team champions I managed Nick and the champions I worked too with Zoom off my angles and the sixth man with Ray and you know Ray Nick and I were kind of like the, the free birds because either one of us could work at any time in that yeah. match so it, it was different. <laughs> me and the, me and the Midnight Express were kind of like the the, the uh, uh, albatross. <laughs> they were the free birds. I was the albatross. If, if I had to be one of their partners, it was no, it wasn't going to work. Other, I, I can't imagine what happened to cause you to leave working for Vernon Gagne with his suave, debonair charm and and political correctness to to go to work for Vince. I wanted to be around somebody with hair. <laughs> <laughs> no. I had no problem with Vern. Vern, uh, Vern paid off better than anybody in the business, except maybe Vin Sr. at that time. Because he had the major time. Yeah. Um, and he yelled and screamed out. He was a disciplinarian. But he, he was okay. He didn't bother me. Every time he started to yell at me, I just said, you know, you're right. I thought about that the moment it happened. And then he came out yeah. And then say, yeah. <laughs> you're Bobby, right. I, 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 you know, I, I was going to tell the same thing, Matt, Matt, Matt same thing, but yeah. when you, I, you're right, yeah. you're right. <laughs> and he didn't know what to say. But, no, he, I mean, what made me leave there was um, money. He, um, I was tired of working four or five times a night. I was managing Saito, I was managing Nick, and I go out and get juice and I run in. I was tired of that. And if I, you want me to work four times, pay me four times. They don't. So New York was a good deal. Managed didn't have to fly every place, didn't have to take bumps or anything. So, and I could see where the business was changing now. <laughs> what he was doing and what his yeah. TV was going to go. I wanted to be a part of that. I had talked to his dad for years, but he would never use me. Cause he had Ernie Roth, he had Albano, and he had Blassie, and he didn't have room for four managers. Yeah. And his deal was great because those guys got preliminary money wherever their guys were. Yeah, all they, didn't have to all they did house. was the TV tape once it. a month, and then the, the, the house shows, they just they'd get a check for like an underneath and match, and, they, and they, go, they weren't even there. And they go to the uh, only house show, they go to the garden. The garden. That was it. But now, I, when you first went to the WWF, because I was <laughs> went from, from Louisiana where I was surprised I remember who the president was, the way we worked the schedule there, and I went to work for Crockett, and we were on the road all the time, so I wasn't keeping up with what Vince was doing. Who did you first go in with in the WWF and and, and what to manage? How they introduced you? 
I was, uh, Vince called me. <clears throat> I was in Denver, and I just saw Minneapolis wasn't going anyplace. And Vince was. So I called Hogan. And they called me a couple of times, Hogan, and wanted me to come, but I didn't want to move. I had a wife and a kid. So I said, uh, I'm in Denver, I'm in the room of where is the best going? Steve Regal, not the Englishman, the other Steve Regal. Yeah, the Snyder's brother. Yeah, Indianapolis, Steve Regal. Yeah. And good I kid, said, by the way. Yeah, good kid. I said, I can't take this anymore. I'm getting out of here. So I called Hogan at home. He said, I'll call you back in five minutes. He called me back. He was in Connecticut. He said, call Vince in the morning. So I went home, called Vince. He gave me a starting date, which was the next week. Or, or a week or so after, I forget. So uh, I, I finished all my bookings, I called Vernon, he gave my notice, he told me to come down to the office. I dare you to, I said, fine, have noon. <laughs> I went to the office, took my wife with me as a witness, had a blade in my pocket. Just, you don't know. Went in the office. It was, it was bitter at that point. Went in the office, he shut the door, he leaned against the door, he told Greg, he said, let's throw him out the window. I sat down, put my hand in my pocket. I said, go ahead, you'll make my wife a very wealthy woman. He said, Bobby, what's wrong? Hey, I'm working three or four times a night. I'm getting the same money as I always do. I don't want to work that much. He said, well, you won't have to anymore. You know, no more spot shows. I'll give you 2500 bucks a week. But some weeks, I don't know where I'd get it from, but I knew what he'd do. As soon as I brought my bridge in New York, yeah. he gave me two grand, 15, be back to where it was, same as all I got, knowing I couldn't go back up there. I said, no, thank you. I've already made my mind up. I'm going, but I'll finish all my dates up. And I did. Yeah. And I... So Vince called, he said, would you manage Jesse Ventura? I said, sure. But then Jesse got blood clots in his legs, and it couldn't work. In San Diego, he got hurt there or something. So I get to the garden that night, and Vince said, call me his office. Second, first time I ever met him. Well, I met him one time when we did the Muhammad Ali thing for the fight with the Onoki. In 76. Yeah, in Chicago. And he didn't say much to us, thank you, we were Minneapolis guys. But now we... He introduced himself to me, we talked, and he asked me if I'd mind managing stud. I said, no, I just wanted to get here. I said, I'd manage world bro. I didn't get here. <laughs> so that was it, and that's how I started with stud. And as I, actually, I saw Ventura, because I hadn't seen him since Memphis. He was another guy I used to drive around. Um, I saw him in the airport when he was coming uh, coming right back to start doing color, because he had gotten the blood clots. Yeah. And he had to take time off, and then he started doing uh, the color. And, and that's and how I got to do the color because he went to see Fredder. Yeah, and, and and that's the thing is that when 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 you went to work for Vince, it kind of started a new phase of your career, and and that's why I think I'm glad you were where you were and I was where I was because I wouldn't have had the spot to do what you were doing where you were doing it, but I got the spot to do what you were doing where I was doing right. it. But no, because Crockett needed a heel color commentator. And I kind of evolved into that spot because you and Jesse had had success with it, and they were, I was counteracting what Vince was doing for them. So I got the chance to get experience doing that because, boy, the way that managing in wrestling has gone these days, you need some experience washing windows or switching toilets or doing something. I was asked a question a little while ago by Gabe about, do you think the day of the manager is over? No, it's never over. The day of knowing how to use a manager or a manager knowing how to be a manager Maybe it's not over. I don't think anybody. I think nowadays they'd rather spend the time having a girl out there with breasts and buttocks rather than a guy out there in a suit. Um, see, with a girl, there's no bow off. You can't get her in a cage at the end and be her up and get butt on her. <laughs> you can't us. You see, there's a bow off on us. There isn't. You can't touch a woman. You can't beat her. It's gratifying for the eye right now, but you can't sell tickets with it to a, past a certain extent. I'm sure if they put a brick in it, and hit the guy, <laughs> yeah. they don't get heat. And the day of anything can never be over with. It's if if everybody all of a sudden just started for no reason sleeping, leaning up against the wall, then the day of the bed would be over with. Because right. they're not using beds. But it doesn't mean that you wouldn't be, that it wouldn't have a purpose if you started using them again. Right. And I did a couple of independent shows a couple of years ago, and there was nobody there. And, and I looked around the dressing room and I watched the matches, and it's very simple. They all do the same thing. None of them dress like wrestlers. They all wear tennis shoes and fumbo shirts with numbers on it, <laughs> silver chains, earrings, and a, a head headband or something. None of them own trunks or boots. 
So the people are buying tickets to look like they're watching apartment wrestling or backyard wrestling. Yeah. They're not seeing wrestling. They're seeing a bunch of young, fat kids out of shape or little kids. And, and there's more gimmicks in the crowd now than there is in the ring. Oh, it looks like a backstage at West Make a Deal. <laughs> and everybody's going to Jamie, and we're going to dress like Rin Tin Tin, you know. And, they, and, they, and they own the company. Tell them what you told me on the phone when we talked a few weeks ago about, about how, why you said it's hard to get heat these days. Do you remember that? <laughs> you said, look at the world these days. Oh, you're watching a kidnapping on TV. <laughs> you see a murder on TV. Um, they got this guy on TV that killed his wife and baby. They're going to hang him. His parents are crying in court. A girl's kidnapped in the mountains. You got a guy over in Iraq uh, they're trying to find now. He's running away from us with a stick. You know, we're chasing the Flintstones over there. <laughs> you got Saddam Hussein, who, uh, you know why Bush and him, uh, you know what Bush and, uh, you know Saddam Hussein and Panny Hills have in common? No. They both irritate Bush. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, they got this guy over there they're trying to find. What was the man of destruction? And, you I mean, we're going to sell out the Coliseum because Bruce the Barber Beefcake cut Ron Bass's whip in half? Yeah. <laughs> this is real stuff happening, man. It's hard to get eaten out by pulling the tights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You pull him in the head, ref. Hey, the ref, yes, you pull his hair? I used to say, yeah. We can do it. Well, the referee's a convicted pedophile or something over here. Yeah, you pull my hair. I don't care. He'll be back. He's got a thing around his head. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, the real world has has impacted wrestling, but that's what the thing is. It's still it's basic human emotions and it's psychology, and whether it's managers or whether it's heels or baby faces, you know Vince Russo. And I know he's not much more popular with you than he is with me. But Russo said there's no heels and baby faces because we have to be more reality based. Well, there are heels and baby faces because there's good people and there's bad people in the world, and there's nothing more reality based or more simple than that. And people like to see Trump plays a heel. There you have it. Simon and the singing show yes. plays a heel. American Idol. Right. Is that people like to have somebody that they can agree with and somebody they can disagree with, and they like to have them engaged in some type of type of issue, whether it's physical or philosophical, so that they can take a side. And ESPN is going to that. Have you noticed that now? Yes. But what they're doing is they're trying to out yeah, each other. They're trying to make it wrestling instead of just disagreeing. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about, Saunders. And yeah. But that's the problem. Too many people are trying to make things like wrestling, including wrestling, that right. don't know anything about wrestling. But it's basic human emotions, love, hate, happiness, sadness, that never goes out of style. And if you learn to, to play on people's emotions, to entertain them in whatever way, you're, you're successful in wrestling or anything else. And it's just that people try to reinvent the wheel and don't understand that, or, or people get involved who, I think, who haven't had the experience as performers who know how to bring <coughs> emotions out of people, like Sid Ray Stevens kicking it up a notch. Like that one you mentioned, um Russo. Uh, oh, jeez. He wanted to hire actors it. instead of wrestlers. He said, we can find guys with big bodies and they can do the same thing. Yeah, teach me. This is a person with really no business in his life, meaning in the wrestling business. He should be outside of Chase Stadium selling uh, memorabilia hats or something. <laughs> Shouldn't have nothing to do with wrestling. There's no nothing about it. And believe me, you can't know nothing about it unless you've done this and had to feed yourself. There are guys out there, how long have you been in the business? Ten years. How many matches you had? Three. Yeah. <laughs> that, don't mean you, that don't mean you've been in the business ten years. And that don't mean you're a worker. Just because you got a car and you got a phone number, it don't mean you're a worker. Yeah. you got to know how to draw money. And you got to live on it. The guys, now, I'm a wrestler. Who do you work for? I work for a little group up in Idaho. We run once a month. You're not a wrestler. Unless you feed yourself off this business. It's, 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 not, it's not impertinent and it's not... Uh, disrespectful to say to somebody who has never been a performer or who doesn't have the experience that you have in any chosen profession, back up, you don't know what you're talking about. Because if if you haven't been in front of people to know how crowds react, to know what happens when this takes place, what happens when that takes place, what kind of effect is this going to have, if you've just watched it on television as a bystander, uh, you know, people say, are you Jim Cornettis? No, I just play him on television. But it, you you got to live that, and you have to experience that, and that's the meaning of the word experience. Then you're able to kind of manipulate it so that you can know what's going to happen. I you tell other people. I went to heal 24 hours a day. I told people all the time at the airport what they could do. I was in, I was in the O'Hare airport once. I was in the a stall. Right? I'm sitting in a stall. The guy reaches in there next to me, hands me a paper piece of paper and a pencil. He said, "Will you sign this?" <laughs> so I signed it, kept his pen, and wiped my ass with the paper. <laughs> Well, I, I they didn't do that. I've been driving a car all my life, and I I would not have the first clue of how to work for Ford Motor Company. 
as, you know, I think people ought to stick with what they know, and, and sometimes I think the wrestling business has been in, invaded by people who think they can perpetrate it because they've watched it on television. Every and athlete, they don't understand the basic concept. And every athlete wants to be an actor, and every actor wants to play baseball or football or wrestling. Yes. And Everybody wants to be something or not. Did you ever want to be anything other than a phony wrestling manager? Because I, I didn't want to be. I, I, I <laughs> didn't. I never asked to be in the business. I see you fell into that. Yeah. I was carrying jacket and sitting in the ring. I never thought about it. I thought somewhere down the road I'd wrestle. Maybe I'd ask. I had to get bigger first. Bruce had called me on the phone. I was working at a Ford dealership. Uh, when the cars came up the trucks, I was signing them in. I wasn't selling cars. I was a car jockey. I was making $62 a month a week or so. He called me on the phone and said, you're the new manager of the assessments. Uh, Bobby and hung up on me. My name was not Bobby, it's Ray. So I called him back. I thought he had the wrong guy. <laughs> he said, no, you'll be at TV tomorrow at noon. So I had to skip my lunch and went down to TV and uh, I was managing the assassins and two mask guys. But Joe DiMasso lived in Kansas City and Bruce didn't want to spend the money to find him in for four interviews. So they put a mask on a mannequin. <laughs> and they had a mannequin there and, I, and Gary Mitchell and me. And I stood there with the mannequin whispering to him. They didn't want me to talk yet. And Gary Mitchell did the interview. And that was, that was it. That's how I started, but I never asked to be in the business. Well, actually, I, I didn't either, because I just, I just kind I of drafted. assimilated into it from buying tickets, watching TV when I was a kid. This happens again, I'm going to Canada. Well, there you have it. Bye, Cracky. You watch TV when you're a kid, and then, and then you buy tickets, and you go to the matches, and then you're a fan, and you kind of understand what the stuff's supposed to look like, and then you hang around long enough doing odd jobs for very little, if any, um, compensation, until somebody says, hey, we're taking advantage of that kid. We can really do that more often by having him work for us and taking advantage of him by paying him much less to do more work. And he didn't call me on the phone because he was concerned about me making 62 bucks a week. <laughs> he wanted to send me to run errands for him. And I had to call him for us today, 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon. He needed something from the hardware store, I had to go there. He never went out in public, bruising. I had to go do this, I had to go do that. And if I came back and couldn't find it, oh, he, he was horrible, just horrible. A really hard person. For me to get along with that personality did not work. In the ring, he was like velvet. Yeah. As a person, I just didn't like him. I only met him a couple of times, and, and really, he would. I only worked actually professionally against him <coughs> once when, in 1982, Indianapolis was all but gone. And he refereed. And, well, uh, actually, Bruiser uh, had called Jerry Jarrett or one way or the other, and Jerry was sending talent up to, to work like Indianapolis and Fort Wayne and, and maybe Terre Haute, I'm not sure, just a couple of the towns, try to keep it going. And because I was the junior manager in town, Jimmy Hart got the good bookings on Thanksgiving weekend, and I went to Indianapolis and Fort Wayne in miserable below freezing temperature, and Kamala was the main event against Bruiser, and since Kamala's Friday wasn't there, they told me, he said, go out and take his stuff. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm going to be in the ring with Dick the Bruiser. You know, for a time I'm this big, I'm like, oh, my God. And, and, I mean, he didn't really speak to me. It's not that he had ignored me. It's just that, why would he? So I go out, I'm just going to take Kamala's stuff and get out of there. And I'm, I'm focusing now on this big, giant, black, Ugandan <laughs> cannibal beast that's in front of me taking his big face mask and all of his spear and everything. And Bruiser walks up behind me, and as I turn around, ah! I'm this close to Dick the Bruiser, and I'm so scared legitimately because I've only been in business six weeks that I forgot to run or back up or anything. And there's this little manager like this just standing in front of Bruiser. Bruiser, go, get out of here, kid. Yes, sir. Shh, off I go. I can imagine he probably would have been intimidating to work for. In, in the ring, in, in talent, business-wise. In the wrestling room, in every place else, he was fine. But you never get respect where you start, anyway. Yeah, and that's true. He uh, was a 20-year-old, 17-year-old kid, driven jackets and everything, and he saw me and stuff, so uh, he, that was in his mind the way he could treat me. And the guy, a classic character, there's, there's, to me, the guys in the business these days, um, yeah, I mean, it's not your fault how you look, it's genetic, but nobody looks like Dick the Bruiser. Nobody looks like Abdullah the Butcher. Nobody looks like well, those people that did they they, they destroy right away. <laughs> yes, they, they, now it's euthanasia. They right. get rid. But nobody looks like that anymore. Everybody looks uh, more normal now. And 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 the guys used to sell tickets just because you looked like a. a you well, know. they still look like that. We're just used to. Them. Well, well that maybe it is. Yeah, <laughs> sure. That's what it's like. Come out. I remember he used to do that, right? Yeah. And I told him, I says, I can hear the dinner bell ring. He said, look at that, I can see the missionary dripping <laughs> off his lips. <laughs> do you know, did you ever see the original Kamala video? Mm. 
Barry Lawler invented Kamala Sugar Bear Harris. Yeah. Right? From he sent me a, an email <laughs> when I was sick of cancer. A nice gesture of that man. A, a great guy, kind-hearted, and with a with a regular head of hair, just was a normal-looking big guy who was a wrestler and had some success in Alabama, Mississippi, whatever. But Lawler, you know, Edie Amin was hot, right? So Lawler said, you got a giant Kamala. They came up with somewhere or another. They took him to Jerry Jarrett's house in the backyard in the weeds. And he painted up Lawler's an artist. He did the paint. They got this African mask. And Michael St. John, uh, an announcer in Nashville, did the voiceover. Kimala, six foot eight. Kimala, 365 pounds. Kimala, the Ugandan giant. And here comes Kamala out of the weeds in Jerry Jerry's backyard. And they're shooting this. And he's got the spear and everything. Kamala coming this week. And Lawler puts him over. There's a time I'm going to mow the lawn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <'cause we're laughs> but Lawler puts him over the first week, right in the middle of the ring, and all of a sudden, and that never happened. The first week in for a guy comes in and beats Lawler right flat up. So all of a sudden he's over, and then he went through every baby face. Steve Kern, Stan Lane, Terry Taylor, Bobby Fold, Bill Dundee, up in the pecking order, Dutch Mandel, whichever order it was, it was arranged in at that time. All the way till he got the rematch with Lawler, and then Lawler beat him that time, so he drew three months of money out of scratch and then went to work for Watts. And all of a sudden, Kamala, and 20 years later, he's still Kamala. Yeah, yeah. And, but, uh, uh, you, and nobody, nobody looks like that, I guess, anymore. Uh, you know, yeah, when you're a kid, it's always your childhood memories. Everybody can identify with that. People are yeah. bigger than life, but, you know. But, well, when I was a kid starting out, uh, Kowalski was a big guy. 275. Doing yeah. a 50 pound guy was a big guy. Yeah. You got kids playing high school ball now that are six, seven, weigh three and a quarter. Yeah. I, I don't know, I don't know what is in. It must be. Well, I, I've got a guy, Matt Morgan in OBW. He's almost seven feet tall, 330 pounds. They brought him up to WWE last year. He didn't really get over. And he was young and he inexperienced. He wasn't quite ready. He is now. He's going to be great. But they teamed him up with the Big Show. And Nathan Jones, the only two bastards in the history of the world that are bigger than his kid. So he's standing next to him, he's seven feet tall, 330 pounds, he looked like you and me. You know, Andre never took a picture of anybody as big as him. There was a basketball player named Manu Bowl. Yes. And he used to come to the Cap Center in Washington. He always wanted to meet Andre. Vince Senior said, don't ever get a picture taken with anybody bigger than you. He stayed away from Ernie Ladd, too. Because there was a well, six man hair seven foot tall. Yeah, that, with the with the afro, uh, there was a six man one time in in Louisville. It was Andre, two baby faces against Jerry Lawler, Ernie Ladd, and you remember Plowboy Frazier? Mm -hmm. I'm sure. He was seven feet too. A, 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 close to. He was about six ten. And and the thing is, he should have had a huge run with Andre, but he never really got out of the South. He had his own issues, you know, size wise. He came up to me one day. He says. How come the giant don't like me? I said, how do you know he don't like it? He said, he told me so. Yeah. <laughs> I said, stay away from him. Yeah, your idea. You. <laughs> but, but, but when you, you saw, there was, there was Ernie and there was Frazier. There was about an inch difference. Ernie was about 6'10", yeah. Frazier was about 6'10", and Andre standing on the other side of the ring, and he had the hair, too, at the mm -hmm. time, but they were pretty close, and they, they did a bear hug spot. It was like, oh, boy. But Andre was always in with Ernie and would never get in with Frazier. And it wasn't because he was worried about him or because no. of the side. Plotwood Frazier was a, had a way of rubbing people wrong, but what a, what a character. I, when I first got in business, I was sitting at Tupelo, Mississippi, and Frazier was next to me on the bench, right? And, I mean, he had those the mud flaps and the skin tags and everything. It was really... Whew. And he had a, a, a jar, a glass jar, like a mason jar, and, he kinda, and it looked like it had piss in it. It was yellow liquid. He kind of screwed the top, he had a gimmick a little bit, he splashed them out in his hands and started doing that. I said, Frazier, what are you doing? He said, I'll buy my cologne by the cow and gallon, neighbor, because I get it cheaper that way. <laughs> he's, Probably he's, was pissed. It, 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 it would have been him. He's usually chunky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the corn or not. But, um, he used to sell gimmick jewelry to the guys. Oh, right? yeah. Shoes and boots and anything. He could we used to call it watches, the Uncle Elmer's. Yeah. <laughs> the Uncle Elmer watches. And Lawler loved having him around because he was entertaining in his own perverse way. Sure. Right? So he'd give him different gimmicks. One week, he'd come in as Playboy Frazier, where he'd be tossing out motel keys. Here he's, he's six foot ten. He's, he's 450 pounds. He's got a big stomach, almost bald anyway, even if he didn't shave it, and just ugly jowls. Playboy Frazier, he's you know, in a big pink tuxedo, and he's passing out hotel keys. 
And then he lost a loser league town when he was a heel one time, so he comes back as the Lone Ranger. And the only disguise is he's wearing the Lone Ranger mask, right? So one night, he's, Jimmy Hart's managing him. <laughs> and Jimmy Hart always carried three bags, four canes, six top hats on his head, right? He's always got all this stuff. Hart comes into, I think, Blytheville, Arkansas. And you go under the bleachers, this little hallway, low hallway thing, right to the, to the locker room door. Hart carries all this stuff through there, barely, barely gets through the thing. Here comes Frazier with his Lone Ranger mask in his bag like that. And somebody says, I know what you, Frazier. He turned around and says, oh, shut up. And bam, he walked right head first into the overhang of the bleachers, knocked himself out in this passageway, right? Hart turns around and goes, come on, Frazier, Frazier, Frazier. Now, it takes everybody in the crew to come out in this narrow hallway because now Frazier's so big, he's like a piece of human cholesterol in this artery that he's clogged. They're, they're pulling him by his feet. He's knocked himself out, and he's stuck, and nobody can get out. Or like a human surprise Exactly. <laughs> so they're trying to expel him from the rectal hallway, and finally they get him pulled in, and he's sitting there, his hands shaking anyway, his hands are shaking like, they brought on if I can go on tonight or not. <laughs> He had, if, if they hadn't been able to Vaseline him, grease him up, and get him out of that hallway, everybody in the locker room would have died because that was the only exit. And he clogged the whole thing. I, I digress. Remember McGuire? Yes, Billy and Betty. I was in um, Sedalia, Missouri one night, and they have a spiral staircase going down through the showers, and one got caught. No, 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 no. And he just was jammed in there somewhere. <laughs> I was on the first floor, I was leaving, but he was jammed. <laughs> They used to work Tennessee a lot because Nick loved the idea of, of the 660-pound twins riding their, you know, motorbikes and everything. And it, they, they were always working as the managers. But, and, and, and Nick Goulas, you did your tour there also. This was like 74. Nick had like five managers. I, I remember Sam Bass was managing Lawler at the time. J.C. Dykes managing the Infernos. Sir Clements would manage a team. Uh, you know, so if there were four or five managers. Yeah, Cheryl, didn't he? Yes, in, in, the, in the car wreck, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was in 75, shortly after this. But what he'd do is they would put the McGuire twins against all the managers. So it'd be like two against three, two against four, two against five, or whatever. And when they shoot Sam Bass in the corner, and they'd run and do the splash, and Sam had a little intestinal difficulty anyway, and he's wearing <laughs> white trunks. Boom! Comes the splash, and all of a sudden, Big brown stain starts spreading in the seat of his pants. <laughs> People believe the McGuire's gimmick. Oh, uh, yeah. They were the shits. I don't know how many of these man is either. They want to wear sunglasses. They think that's yeah. cool. First of all, I'm savage. I don't like him wearing glasses because he has gray eyes. Oh, yeah, you got to see the And intensity. Jimmy Hart has gray eyes. Flair has gray eyes. Don't wear sunglasses. <laughs> So I guys like to wear that, and they all think they got to wear tuxedos, and they all think they got to carry a cane. The reason I never carry anything is because if they take it away from me, they'll kill me with it. Yeah. And you can't take bumps with something. Your whole yeah, you were, you were taking a lot of bumps. Yeah, and you can't get your bite out when you got a cane in your hand yeah. and a microphone, and you get... Well, the reason I had the, the, the tennis racket, I, when I started, I didn't use it, but when, when I went to Louisiana... Uh, you know, everybody been telling me, okay, the fans are different than in Tennessee down there. And I don't know, I've worked Tennessee and Georgia and the, the, you know, those territories, but I've never been to Louisiana. So the first couple of TVs we did for Bill Watts, I didn't have anything. And you can see those old tapes. I was just standing there, just me, which I needed a lot of help at that point anyway. But I saw the fans and I said, oh my God, these people are going to flat kill me. And I went home at Christmas time right before we started, back to Nashville, and I watched one of those teen movies that was big in the, in the early 80s, and the rich kid of the group was running around with a badminton racket. I said, ah, hadn't been done. Umbrella's been done, cane's been done, everything's been done, but not a tennis racket. And that'll give me some reach on the marks. And <laughs> son of a gun, it came in handy. It got over the first year for saving my life in a shooting situation, sure. and I kept using it as a, as a gimmick. But oh, I yeah. needed it badly. <clears throat> we were outnumbered. We always are. <laughs> I just didn't like to carry some in my hand. And a lot of guys, there would be a guy hanging the, the hang guy's head over the second rope. And he'll run around, pull down the guy's head. Yeah. I never like to do anything unless it's a finish. Yeah. Otherwise, it don't mean nothing. Then when I do something in the end, it don't mean nothing. And everybody in the manager always said, don't let him get to you, don't let him get to you. I listened to that for a while. And I get to thinking, what do they pay to see? They want to see them get to me. Yeah. So I make them happy. I had the ability to take bombs and bleed. So I'd give it to them. I'd give it to them every night, they'll be happy. They like raise upside down every night. 
But yeah. if you can't do it and it doesn't look good, don't do it. Well, there, there's a line, you, you can't give them so much that they don't want to see anymore, but as long as you're giving them what they want to see and they still want to see it, you're sure. okay. And they used to beat, beat the crap out of me in Tennessee, you know, when I was out four or five times a night, you know, or being Jimmy Hart's second banana manager in the spot shows or whatever at a wrestling the Battle Royal, and they, they just saw so much of me. My, my mother didn't want to see that much of me. But later on when I got to put in a spot, you take a little poke every now and then that just gets them ready to see you knocked out that much more, and you give them enough. Don't let this guy maybe get to you because you're saving it for that guy not next year but just next week. Yeah. Because a lot of times they say, oh, Wait for, you know, don't let so-and-so touch you. Don't let anybody touch you because in a year from now, well, a year from now, they won't care because they didn't see nothing they wanted to see from you. Well, you don't want the underneath guy to touch you. Yeah. The top guy, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> that you can do it. And if you've got enough heat, one one punch is not going to uh, not gonna take all the heat off of you. Oh, if, if you, I worked with Bruiser, and uh, he threw me in the ropes one night, and I, I hung myself. And so he starts, so I'm starting to get my color. But no, I had to take one hand off, right? Yeah. Now the ropes are starting. Oh my God. Now the thing's going around the faucet. Oh. And the building's getting quiet. He says to me, not enough. Now people are starting to feel sorry for me. Yeah, now you're getting something. So I then tied myself and fell down and got up and spit on the people. And then the heat came back. Yeah. But they, I'm a poor old white meat guy trapped. Yeah. And well, that's they the it's, it's like Mick Foley and Cactus Jack, when he was... We took the bump off the cage, which was about as far as any human being could go and live. After that, when he was doing Dude Love, he, he was telling me in the locker room, he said, I, I feel like I'm cheating people. I said, what do you mean? Well, I'm not doing my cactus jack bumps. I'm not doing this. And I said, cactus, you're making them, I always call him cactus, cactus, you're making them happy because they want to see you. And they like Dude Love because it's another thing that you can do. Because he got to the point where his bumps were so cringe-inducing that the people that liked him, that genuinely could tell he was a good person and were fans of his, were not excited by what he was doing. They were more like, oh, God, we wish he wouldn't do that anymore. He's going to hurt himself. It was almost getting the uh, wrong... As long as the checks were coming good, they were liking it. Yeah. <laughs> they liked it, maybe. You know, but but, him. but he, he would go so far that the, that the fans would go, oh, you know, you know oh, gosh, boy, he's going to hurt himself. And it was, you know, like you said, it was kind of quieting people down a little bit. So he had to slow it down a little bit, and then he could give it to them. And that's another fallacy about our business. They always say red makes the green. You've heard of that? Yes. Now, if you and I are taking partners against, say, Brunzel and on Ganya, and I get the juice, and we get $1,000, we come back and the house is better. I get 12. Well, I get 12. Well, why did I? I should, I should get more than you. You're the only one Yeah, it makes green for her, not for yeah. me. But, well, I'll believe it. Huh? I got one for everybody. Yeah. I'll get that everybody. I don't care. <laughs> well, she would do that a lot anyway. <laughs> but see, nowadays, you know, with the AIDS and everything, you don't want another guy's butt near you. Well, see, I, you know, I, and I got to admit, that's another thing. You did a lot more than me because... Uh, and, and it wasn't that I ever refused to, to get juice. It's just that they, a lot of times I was never asked. I, I don't know what the thinking was, but I was working for Dusty Rhodes, and I only got juice three or four times while working for him. I actually got juice. I used to get juice three times a day in Bruce's garage. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got juice more often with myself as Booker in Knoxville mm -hmm. than I think that I did in the rest of my career when I was on top making real money instead of working for myself going broke. Um, but nobody asked me to, I don't know what it was, except for the thing with Paul Lee and a few choice spots. But then when it happened, it was more shocking on me, you know, whatever. But the point being, um, I, I don't care whether I'm inexperienced or not. I would rather, if I'm going to take a razor-sharp instrument and, and cut my own self, I believe I'd rather be the one to do it than have somebody else do it for me, even if they've done it a lot more often. <laughs> because they're not going to be as careful as I am. I know we've got Louis Martinez. Arriba. You know, he was scared to death to do it. So I was going to do it for him. So what I do is I post him. As I post him, I whack him. I bang and post him. But he would he snap your hand though. I see you scared of you too. Yeah, yeah. And one guy named uh, Ivan Kamakoff, he was getting scared of it. And somebody bloated him once. And they put it in, he went, I don't want to rush his oh. eyes and his lips. Uh, he's, he's been bleeding since 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> he could be down about 30. It was 107 pounds. 
Yeah, I, I never understood it just because you're you're nervous about it. Let somebody else do it, and especially you know, and look look at somebody's head. You, you want the sheep taking a knife to you or a blade to you or any kind of sharp <laughs> instrument to you? Yeah, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, it's the same thing. space, same speed. Yeah, same right. Same right. Cross. But um, and Mustafa, you were uh, Levi's. Can you get me standing up? Yeah. He carried his blade in his left pocket. But he was right-handed. <laughs> so you go. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> he put that, he go. He could never get his hands out of his pocket. And Wilbur Snyder was terrified of the boat. Say, Wilbur, come on. I don't ever remember him getting juice. <laughs> I mean, I have a reason for that. Birdie one time. Dust. No <laughs> <laughs> boy, just dust came in. But we were had to go, so we were get. We said, okay, well, we we hit him. Go we hit him. You go. <laughs> Come on, we're <laughs> Come on, we're ready for his hand. <laughs> every every other side of the building, he go. That's enough. It's enough. <laughs> that was it. Some guys didn't do it. Anyway, we went to the thing with Paul E. At, at, at TBS, and I got cracked, because I hadn't done it but a few times, right? I got through all through Watts in Louisiana, but I was busted open a number of times the hard way by my own clumsiness and other people just whacking me, but I never actually done it. So, Paul e. hits me with the phone, and I've got the blade ready, right? And it's taped inside my white jacket. I'm wearing the white jacket for the occasion. I'm ready to go, right? And I'm desperately nervous of people seeing me. That's what I was nervous about. I didn't want people to see me. So he whacks me with the phone and take a big bump and I turn over and I real quick I go and nothing, nothing. I didn't know that it's like 60 degrees in the television studio, right? And I'd just been out there for a couple minutes, so I'm cold. So in a panic, I go <laughs> three <laughs> times. Then it all comes at the same time. Now that's, you know, when, when Dusty's in Africa, I'm juiced. I got the white jacket on. I look like I've been run through a razor blade factory. And I come back and does this. I said, a little juice, kid. I didn't know. I didn't mean to do it. It's just, that's, you know, that's what happened. You grab your nose. Belong to it. <laughs> and then I'm making pressure. Well, as my, Randy Hales in Memphis one time, was he was the booker and, and promoter and had a baby face, jack of all trades. He's good at getting color. He drank like six beers and took like eight aspirin and almost bled to death. He was in a puddle. Oh, they almost had to carry him out in a bucket. Well, but he bite you, remember? Watch the picture when Brassy and Bayer, he'd hold your nose. Ah! Oh, yeah, see that? There you breathe, go. Boom, it comes. I always would do it. If I didn't see it dripping, I just take it in more. You, you heard the, have you heard the Grizzly Smith story? Uh, Grizzly Smith and Luke Brown were Kentuckians. I can't remember who they were working with. Probably, uh, uh, doesn't matter. Grizzly goes down to get juice. They've got the long hair. <laughs> he goes down, he does this, and he comes up, and he cut his bangs straight off right, right there. Just all the, where his long hair was, all the, he saw nothing. Well, Ramsey used to wear his blade on this finger. And then he'd, lift, and then he'd wear his blade. Then he'd lift the tape up, and he would do that thing. But while he was punching it, he'd be holding you here. Yeah. So I went one night, he's working with Watts, and I said, Jack, I think you're going to sit there and watch his head. <laughs> the back of his neck was bleeding. <laughs> the, the sheik really wore one on every finger, didn't he? It, for the people, mostly. For himself, but also for, for, yeah. the, for the heat that he had. He had a straight razor in his trunks. And he, 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 cut your, he would come out of the ring. He was, he was an Arab. He was tough. Yeah. He was a mean man. But he had so much heat. And oh, yeah. all, in most places, people were scared of him to where they wouldn't even come close no. to him. He was the first one to bring a snake out. I saw him in Indianapolis in Market Square Arena in 75, and he had the snake. And I was like, oh, Jesus. Oh, and yeah. people just stampeded from ringside. They believed him. If you did that now, people in the front row would be going, oh, okay, he's got a snake. But the, literally the first six rows ran, jumping over the row behind him to get away from this Because his character, you didn't know what he would do with the snake. Exactly. I, in Louisville, one day, Johnny Randolph was was a DJ for Wacky Radio, the Top 40 station, and he was the ring announcer uh, in the gardens, and she came down and worked with Crazy Luke Graham. <laughs> and, and Luke Graham, believe it or not, was the baby face in this instance, because of some screwy Tennessee stuff they'd done. And she comes in, and Johnny Randolph is not smart. He's a DJ. He's the announcer. They never involved him in anything, and she just tackled him. And the reaction from Randolph was, was legitimate because he didn't know what was happening or whether he's going to make it out alive or not. And here's the sheik who he didn't see very often, you know, on top of him, ripped his shirt off 
He ran out the back of, of the local gardens, turned right, went all the way to Fourth Street, all the way to the radio station before he stopped. And they had to get another announcer for the next two matches. And everybody in Louisville remembers the DJ that ran three blocks to the radio station I had from the Sheik and it got him over, like that. You believe that man? Yes, you believed it, uh, 100%. And yeah. Terry Funk had to that ability too. To, you know, you oh, were yeah. not quite sure whether Terry was... I actually thought it was nuts. You know, what do you mean thought? Well, <laughs> there you have it. Good man. <laughs> But some guys go out there and, you know, like Piper. I never saw another guy that wanted to be Piper. Think of that gimmick. Yeah. I mean, I, nobody ever has a Scottish gimmick. But Piper. Yeah. I don't know why. It, it, you don't want to wear a dress. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know whether, whether anybody could have done it any better. No. It, it was pretty well done. And he didn't do it. He didn't speak with a bro. <laughs> he just wore a collab mini suit. That was it. <laughs> he just got over so much whenever somebody, and that, I think that's a trademark of, Whenever somebody is over, is if you see what they wore or what they carried or what they did, whatever, if you see something that's identified with them, you think of that person. It's like um, for uh, Bobby and Dennis Condry, a couple of these reunion matches, they've had uh, one of Bobby's friends going out with them when I isn't there. When I isn't there. When I isn't there. Well, that's like, I'll finish this story and then, <laughs> then I'll finish this. It's, it really is bright, folks. When I isn't there. When I'm not there. They used one of Bobby's friends, and somebody said, hey, let him carry a test right. He said, no, because why remind the fans of the guy that isn't here? Then all you're doing is saying, well, you know, by the way, that guy that isn't here, you, you should be seeing him too. No, concentrate on who is there. I think that's a tribute when people see gimmicks of that nature and they think of that person, and, you know, that they got it over. Do you, 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 you who would be a great manager? <clears throat> Shane McMahon. Yes. <clears throat> He's got that cocky look about him, because he is. Yeah. He's got money. He's he got does. power. Because he does. He can take bumps. He's young. He looks good. And balls this big because he's got to <laughs> prove that, that it, it's not, he's not just there because he has the money and the power, etc. He's going to fall off the roof because he wants to show everybody he's Yeah. Here. And he, and Vince too, those guys, they're just, they were perfect managers. I, 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 That's why I was at Beverly Hills. Because that was the money. Was. Other guys used to say, the bottom from Hollywood, California. Even yeah. Hollywood was the sewer. So yeah, Billy Hill sounds like there's money. And there's no blondes. No. Everybody, everybody, they paid a rally. I'm on a plane and the guy says, where are you from? I said, uh, Beverly Hills. He said, I live there. Where at do you live? Uh, I didn't know the street. Uh, Has he ever seen that sign said Hollywood? He said, yeah, I said, I'm so much behind <laughs> He said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm sales. He said, what do you sell? I said, I sell a turnbuckle from backdrop. <laughs> that was it. I sent Vince a note after the match he had with Ric Flair on pay-per-view. Because there is Ric Flair channeling Buddy Rogers in, in some respects, the blonde hair, and there's Vince channeling Buddy Rogers with the heel mannerisms, and the combined age in the match was like 111, and they had the best match on the show to me for psychology. And, you know, that's amazing that a 60-year-old billionaire and a 50-year-old uh, guy that's been, uh, had a broken back 30 years ago could have the best match on the show, but... I mean, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll, see, you'll see both peeps hook the sheep from the minute. <laughs> Shut up, Cornette. Quiet. That's another of those phantom uh, breaks where we really didn't go anywhere, but we, we did. I don't mean to dominate. No, the, no. The questioning here, because I'm just, I'm just, you tickle me. And I, I love hearing stories. I, I know my own stories. I'm and, enjoying this. And plus, they've heard me before. Who's the worst team you ever managed? Oh, my, the worst. Um... The worst in concept, Bart Gunn and Bob Holly, the new Midnight Express for about six weeks in the WWF uh, in 1997 because they didn't want to be there. They wanted to be there, but they didn't want to be the new Midnight Express and nobody else wanted to be either. But the single most mortifying moment I think I ever, I, the, the Headhunters, the two 400-pound twins, the, the Davy Boy Smith and, and, and Owen Hart actually did not want to for some reason, cooperated in any way, shape, or form with, with what these guys did. And I was managing Davey Boy and Owen, but I was out there to get some of it on me, too. And these 400 pound guys come out, and, and Owen just doesn't do it because they, they got over in their own style, but they weren't really in this picture. Davey Boy, first thing he does is body slam one of them. <laughs> okay, so that's out the window. And Owen did something else, it just made him look like a bunch of idiots. I'm going, oh, geez. But Mantor. <laughs> Man, does anybody in the room remember <laughs> Mantor? It was almost a real, I, I'd been managing in, in for Vince Yokozuna, the WWF champion, and Vader, who was a challenger, and, and Bulldog and Owen, who, you know, were 
reputable contenders for anything and top talent, right? And all of a sudden, at a TV one night, they brought in Mantor, who I think his name is Mike Halleck, and you're looking at me with a puzzled look that most wrestling fans mirrored. Uh, because <laughs> who the hell is this guy? No, he was he was in and out. Believe me, he was he was through the door, grabbed the Fritos, and he was gone. But he had a giant, it was almost like a Muschola gimmick, but he had a giant. What was he wore on his head? Was that it? Wasn't a bull? It, it was a he was he was a man tour like a. Uh, <laughs> See, I'm trying. I swear to God, we're trying to explain the man man bull. But it wasn't a bull. Was it a bison or a, it was some type of thing? Nobody, nobody understood this. The guy was huge. His head was as big as his table. He had a big body. He was a nice guy. This gimmick was didn't, and people were watching their televisions with a look on your face that you've got right now. And at about 15 minutes before he goes out, and we've been snickering all day because this guy wore a big moose, and not a moose, or a bull, or a bite. I don't know what it was. They may have invented this animal. <laughs> Man tar. <laughs> and they came to me and said, you're, you're managing him. I, uh, Okay, right. Yeah, we've been joking about this. Like, yeah, no, you're managing. <laughs> no, you're managing. I look on the board with Cornette. I'm, oh, my God. I couldn't save it. Nothing could have saved it. The, the guy, like I said, he was a nice guy. If he's watching this, and God bless him. He is. Please, I like you're a great guy, but Jesus Christ, you need, I'm glad you found another profession, which you must have because I've heard of you in ages. He got back greetings. <laughs> <laughs> He would charge into the turnbuckle and the baby face would move and he'd hit the turnbuckle and stagger back and it'd be one of those suspended in time moments before he turned around. His timing was just all off. And I'm out there going, please God, I've made it 15 years in the business and, and I've never actually just had shit dripping down my face. If there's some way I could just get a coat of Teflon so that this doesn't stick on me. And thank God it was over with and now nobody like you and all of you remember Mantor. It was pretty abysmal. I, I, it gave new meaning to the word putrefaction. It was, it was, it was highly stinkerific. Wow. What, what did you? What's the worst thing you ever did in the business? E e either, either, the, either the most embarrassing position you ever got in. Something didn't work right. Something didn't happen. The worst talent you ever managed. Just to, the point where you said, "Oh my God." Why am I involved in this? Oh, Boxwings and I were in, um, we went down for Joe Blanchard down in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. And Nick's wrestling this guy called the Brown Owl or something like that. <laughs> the Brown Owl? That's the most famous guy. Should have been. He's the most famous guy, a little Mexican guy, and he had a mask on, and he had his boots about this high of a waist around his legs, 40 times. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Nick's talking to the guy, and Nick says, um, I want you to come off the ropes and hit me with a tackle at a 45 degree angle. <laughs> and the guy will see you. And Nick said, I said, wait a minute. I said, sir, do you, do you know who this man is? No. I said, Nick, the guy don't know your name. Think he knows what a 45 degree angle is? I said, how do you make a comeback? He said, I hit the rope. I said, Nick, you're on your own. <laughs> Next day, we go to Austin, Texas. And Nick's wrestling the same guy. And every time Nick puts the guy in a hold, it winds up hurting Nick. <laughs> so I left. I took my chair, folded, put it under the ring, I turned to people, and I <laughs> back to the rest of Joe Blanchard says, Bob, you gotta go back out there. She's one of my career, Joe. I said, you go out there. He's Bobby. I said, you go out there. So Joe goes out there, he comes back my two minutes, he says, stay here. <laughs> and just, some nights it just doesn't work. The worst guys I ever had in the ring were the Vines. Because they would always do the same things over and over. They always did. They did have their set pattern of match. They did, they did, they did a girls' midget match. Like they'd come back to the corner and they'd grab your arm and they'd pump like yeah, the other guys. Yeah, they, they, were the only, they were the only team in the business that were doing the Tennessee spots that weren't working in Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> the arm pump and the, and the tiptoe. And, 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 and you know, I take them, I drive, because I don't like to drive anybody. I like to come and go when I want. So I, every two years, I always had a new cow. I said, guys, stocking caps, blonde hair. You know, they wouldn't wear hats or nothing. And, you know, it was embarrassing people to see on the road and stuff. And so um, then they would just weren't fun to be around or to be in the ring with. Just weren't the kind of guys I wanted to be around. They were 
And especially if, 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 if your tag team doesn't particularly get along with each other or doesn't agree with each other on the same page a lot of times, it's kind of miserable. And they didn't agree with each other. I mean, yeah, that, that is not fun for you to be around. And, you know, I, I was just... <clears throat> it just wasn't fun because every match was the same, and they were dangerous. They get in the ring, they they swore off. I'd be standing there. They weren't worried about people. <laughs> were. They had those broad gestures, which look great for heels, but at the same time, I'm, I'm behind you. Yeah, yeah, please, Jimmy Hart. When when I started, <laughs> you know, and and Dundee when Bill Dundee was a booker in Memphis, he kind of featured me more because Jerry Lawler, he was the booker, featured Jimmy Hart more because he had started Hart, and Dundee was on my watch. So it was kind of. I was in competition for Jimmy at that point in time because I was new. I didn't know what I was doing, and he was way over. But by the same point, they lumped us together because we were the two managers. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we're in handicap matches against the baby faces and whatever. Je I may have told this story before, but I'm going to tell it to Bobby. If you've heard it, please bear with us, or you can come back in about three and a half minutes. <laughs> um, Jimmy loses a match, or his guy let him lose a match in Memphis where he has to wear a chicken suit for a week. But now, <laughs> that includes all the shows anywhere around Memphis, so I come into Blythe Arkansas again one night, and it's supposed to be me and Jimmy Hart against Coco Ware, and I walk down that hallway and through the thing, and, and as soon as you open the door, there's the toilet with no, no door on the stall or anything, there's a toilet. And there's Jimmy sitting there on the toilet, sitting there, reading the newspaper in a chicken suit with the red beak, <laughs> with the beak up on top of his head so that he could see. Could have been hatching. And, 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 and somebody was sitting there hatching an egg. And he wasn't using the toilet, it was just that was the most comfortable place to sit in the locker room. So I said, uh, okay, you must have lost that match because I wasn't booked in Memphis because I would have been a good payoff at that time. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, Jimmy, we got this match with Cody, you bring your dress. He said, I got to wear the suit. I said, you're going to wrestle in the chicken suit? Well, I got to because of stipulation. He said, now listen. He said, they told me it's rented and it, I don't want to tear it. So I'll just stay back and I'll throw a couple of kicks and you do most of this because I don't want to rip the suit up. I said, okay, yeah. So I'm trying my best to, I, nobody ever taught me how to work. I'm trying my best to get some heat on Coco Ware. And there's Jimmy, every time he'll kick with the webbed foot, the beak will fall down over his face. So he has to stop and lift the beak up so he can kick again because then he can't see, but then the beak will fall back down again. He's drawn back, he draws back to punch, he hits me with his wing, boom, feathers in my mouth. And finally, when we got through with the thing, he's blowed up, right? I'm, I'm dying over here, and he's going, thank God the suit's okay. But every time you would get around Jimmy, he was so peripatetic, and his, his blood pressure had to be 300 over 250. He was so hyper. The first time that we had to work against each other, he said, I'll, I'll just, I'll tackle you, tackle you, and we'll roll around, we'll roll around. Okay, Jimmy, okay, just whatever you want. He'd tackle you, he was rolling on my face, he's rolling. He was so worked up. I mean, he makes me look almost comatose at that point in time, 20 years he's ago. He's hyper. He's a hyper guy. He would kill you if he was if he was your opponent or your partner. He'd, he'd beat you to death just from being amped up. He's got a lot of energy. He <laughs> really is. And he works harder what he does. He, he really sleeps does. four hours a night. He'd be up every morning at the radio station plugging, doing publicity. And, and you know, I love Jimmy. He, he taught me a lot. Uh, he taught me what to do and what not to do. He taught me what to do by helping teach me. He taught me what not to do by seeing some of the things he did. Because he, he broke almost every bone in his body when he first started. Imagine. My bad. Falling down himself. He, and and Laura broke his jaw for him, but he broke almost everything else. Well... It just, it's just a whole totally different business. And, I, you know, and where the guys learn to work the most were in cars. That's where you want to yeah. do your interviews. That's where you want to work. You talk things over with guys riding. And uh, dressing room was the fun part of the business. That's where you laugh and you pull the ribs and stuff. The matches, if you had a good match, that was fun. If had a bad match, it was horrible. But in the car with the beer on the way home, yeah. talking with the guys to the next town, that's where you hang your fun. And if you had a bad match, you actually learned more in the car because it's, if you had a great match, you'd talk about fun stuff in the car. But if you had a bad match, you would beat it to death, figure out right. why, what was wrong, and what can we not do again to have a stinker like that all the way back home. Yeah. And now the guys are on planes and they can't talk to each other and they don't talk anyway, you know, a, a lot about that and it's, you miss that. Well, you, you watch the guy go up there and they don't work anymore in holes or different size. But we used to watch the guy before, so we don't work the arm. If they're working the arm, we yeah. work their leg or something. The guys don't do that anymore. All, all guys today, first thing they do when they hit the ring, they jump on the second rope. They hear people yell, they figure, I'm over. I got to get taller, too. I was about, uh, the greatest uh, athletes in the world are guys. <coughs> this, this past, you know that? I'm sorry? Jackies. Yeah, you. Yeah, to to you know how hard it is to you have to work to stay that short? <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. This this past week, talking about what you said, watching the matches, 
but also you have to you have to know to inquire because uh, the OVW championship is going to change hands because the champion was going to have an injured left arm for what one of the heels would attack him before the match injure his arm he wouldn't forfeit he'd go on with the match with the bad arm he'd get kicked off into the post boom the arm and then he's, he'd blah, blah blah first match on the show what's the he'll start doing working with the guy's left arm you also should know enough to inquire to make yourself uh, uh, informed about what's going to go on in the, the major parts of the show so that you don't go out and do Nobody would have used a pencil with a sheik in the main event in the first match. Elsewise, the pencil would have been used twice that night. Once mm -hmm. in the first match and once on the guy that used it. <laughs> and um, the the eraser. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, is more, which is a more brutal end anyway. But, you know, a lot of guys, they don't understand. You can't, you can't tell the same joke twice in one night for the same crowd. Because the second time it falls on its ass. And when it's, when it's not the opening comedian, but it's George Carlin or, or the main event, doing it and they do it the second time and it don't get over then the uh, opening guy didn't ever get off the open. We had this guy in Chicago in Indianapolis, Moose Cholak. Moose was about 375, about 6 foot 5 and he was really clumsy and he didn't really care if he hurt you or not and he, he wrestled a little bit in college and boxed in the Navy. So he knew just enough to become totally dangerous. <laughs> And that's why I wanted to take bumps out of the ring, because Moose wouldn't go after you, so he'd have to get back in. He'd have to crawl down and get yeah, back up. That's how I just saved myself. <laughs> but Moose was horrible. He was just... From Moosehead, Maine. Right. From South Side of Chicago. <laughs> and he would just, he would just demolish you. Just demolish you. And he never washed his jeans, and he smelled like an outhouse floor. <laughs> and he was just, just horrible. He squashed you in the corner and lay on you, and just... It was like we were working with a moose. There's nothing you could do with the guy. But, boy, he would have um, done. You'd always get him in a position where you could make him miss something. Say, squash me in the corner. He'd come around, he'd help, boom. He'd hit you the wrong way. He's hoping to tire him out. No, he'd stand, he'd stand on your ears and stuff. He was just horrible. But uh, a real nice guy, but I mean, just... It, dangerous. It, there's a lot of nice guys that, that just aren't intended for this profession. Like you be twisting the guy's arm, right? Moose would be selling like this. Oh, yeah. You know, snapping your shoulder, yeah. like, slapping you. Moose. As a matter of fact, one of those, in volume one of this uh, monologue that we had going on, we talked about the Bob Loose classics. The only guy that he could find, I guess, on one particular day to interview was, was Moose Cholak. I guess Moose still lives in Chicago. He, he did, yeah. Uh, I don't Moose know. passed away. I'm, God bless him. Uh, but it's Bob Luce who couldn't put a coherent sentence together with three Webster's dictionaries. And Moose Cholak, who not only had a lisp, but not a very good command of the English language to begin with. Chicago accent. And, and, and it's Chicago, you know, these goes and there. And, and they're trying to do stand-up comedy, between which was funny in its own just really perverted way. It was hilarious to me to watch. And they went on for like five or six minutes. And the joke that they were telling and the funny story that they were telling was obviously funny to both of them. But try as I might with taking notes and everything, I still couldn't figure it. It's like the mentor thing. You couldn't really figure it out. Well, like um, Moose, the first time the Valiants came in, they interviewed him. What do you think about this younger Valiant coming in now? Well, I don't know what Moose was thinking. He said, well, he's just like his brother. They're just a couple of queers. <laughs> that moose, you can't say that. They need some Yeah, you can't yeah. say that moose. <laughs> That's what he thought. And he's the one that was lisping. Yeah. The 375 pound guy with the list. Yeah, they did a couple of queers. <laughs> oh, my God. I asked Ice Snyder once on Bruiser. I said, why don't you turn his heel? They said, moose turns heel and the office turns heel. They don't want to work with him. Yeah, exactly. So they gave him us. That, uh... There were a lot of guys like that that just were dangerous. And a lot of guys that uh, took chief shots with you. They didn't have to. They could work when they wanted to. You can tell. Sometimes. Yeah. And Billy Robinson was like that. Billy Robinson, if you wanted to work with you, you could. Sometimes if you didn't have a bad night, you didn't want to, he was Fabulous talent, but he was somewhat opinionated, wasn't he? Uh, or, or well, he was raised but, in but, uh, different mental uh, wrestling style over yeah. in Europe than he is here. And so, I don't know. But he was, he could, he, he could go, when, especially when he first came over to work with uh, with Vern. Uh, they had some great matches, which I've seen tape of it. And I got to see him actually <laughs> when when he, he came to, through Memphis at one time. He had some bad matches with some guys. He he wasn't going to adapt to somebody else's style, was he? They, they pretty well they needed to wrestle because he wasn't going to do bullshit. No, if they didn't do something that he did right, 
Oh, it looks good. Then he went on and hurt you. Yeah, which doesn't make for a good match. No, and you know always hurts him if they give you the body. But but he had tremendous matches with Tony Charles. Cause oh, sure. Uh, European style. Mm -hmm. He had great matches with Bill Dundee. And, there, and Robinson is was like 44, probably at the time, 45. They go 40 minutes, and Dundee, who was in pretty good shape himself at that time, would be worn out, and Robinson wouldn't hardly even be sweating. And this is when he was kind of big. But at the same time, if he... if if they he didn't do if the other guy didn't do the style right, it wasn't gonna be. Yeah, some guys spend the depth, and some guys if they have a finish, they want a half hour finish. Yeah. And, and then I'll do this team that. If one thing messes up, they have to go back and start over. Yeah. Well, I always said, when do you want me in the ring? When I'm far in there, I don't need to know what he's gonna do and save and this and that because yeah. it might happen earlier. The same spot, I don't want to jump in the ring two minutes ago and match yeah. is over. Just tell me, I'll fall in there, I'll get in. And the easiest thing to do with a manager is when you want him in the ring, have you guys say, come on! Yeah! Well, you know it! Well, yeah, <laughs> you're supposed to be communicating sure. on the same team. Come hit my opponent! Yeah, sure. you can tell the guy. Yeah. And that's why I'd always, I, I, I don't know how guys these days, I hesitate to say the word kids, I don't know how guys these days memorize these 20 minute I'm going to do this and this and this, and then I'll twist your finger like this, and you fart, and then for, for 20 minutes, I I can't, I, like I don't say the same thing twice on promos. Even if I do, if, if something happens, take breaks, i got to do it again, I can't say exactly what I said before. I can tell you the same story, but the words won't be said. And I couldn't never read lines with the Dick Eversall when they were doing for Saturday Night yeah, Night And I told Dick I'd never been able to do it. He says, don't. Get the meat of it and do, do Bobby Hannon. So he was good about that. Yeah. And I, I can't read what was written for me. I have to do my own. Well, how can somebody write Bobby Heenan for Bobby Heenan? Uh, I'm not a trained actor. Uh, and these people are actors. And they, they have to, they're trained for it. You, read, you know how they memorize most lines? Yeah. Uh, rhythmically, they, and music. And music, you remember oh, yeah, songs, yeah. but it, you don't it, remember it, lines. So that's how they teach it. But I know good. I just got to do my own. But still, you know, most actors can't take that backwards bump over the top rope. No. So I, I always think... It, the reason why wrest, wrestling is a hybrid, it's not really acting, it's react. And you can't prepare a script that somebody follows word for word because it has to be uh, the intensity and the passion and the emotion of that person saying or doing whatever they're doing. So tell me the joke you want me to tell, and I'll paraphrase it and tell it the way I want, or the story, or the match, or whatever. But Bobby Heenan has to be Bobby Heenan, Jim Cornette, Jim Cornette, Ric Flair, Ric Flair, or whatever. Notice how I put us in that company. Um, <laughs> Who? Yeah, <laughs> that kid from Minnesota. Um, but y you know, it, it, it's, it, it becomes bland and homogenized when one person is telling people exactly what to say and do, or one group is telling people exactly what to say and do. I think you ought to kind of monitor it and manipulate it and put the matches See, together I, and get the story, but leave the the details to the talent. I never held a title. I never had a belt. Why? Obviously, I didn't look for the part, so I shouldn't have had a belt. And there are guys in this business that can't understand why they never got over. Well, they shouldn't have been in that position. Mickey Rooney's a great actor, but you don't want to see him and go with the wind. Yeah, exactly. He's an actor. He's a different, different part, you know, and that's what it is. Like um, Diamond Dallas Page was a WC champion. Sorry, he's not world champion. Nice guy, yeah. but he's not world champion. You know who would have been the greatest world champion? Wahoo. Yep. He was an American Indian. Yep. He did play football for Oklahoma. He played for the uh, Jets, Denver Broncos, and Miami. And Houston? They he played for Houston? Yeah, also. and, and, he, and he, is, and he is an Indian. He is an athlete. He did do what he says. He could draw you money. He could talk. But they didn't trust Wild because he was always bitching about his money. Then pay the man fairly. Tell him what he was going to make him. Yeah. And then he'd give him a shot at He would have been a perfect world champion. The pressure he got on him? It would have been perfect. Well, yeah, we can't trust him because, geez, if we scream, he'll leave without driving a belt. Look, don't scream. <laughs> but that's why you have the deposit in the belt. Yeah. So, 10 put on 50 grand deposit. He would walk out on that. But just pay him. Tell him, this is what you're going to make. If why if, if McDaniel felt like he was getting getting stuck in the ass, he would leave him on the $5 million. That's yeah, but 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 that's one of the reasons why most of the boys have respect for Wahoo because he would leave on something if he felt it was that way. We had an angle. We didn't. Uh, Bill Eaton and I. When he was a superstar in Georgia. We had an angle with Wahoo, where we had him brought from Columbus, Georgia, on Wednesdays. So he had to come back as Mr. Columbus for a hood. Yeah. 
never threw a punch, still chopped. He yeah. knew what was wrong. Yeah. So we got a battle royal tonight. So I tie his mask to the top rope <laughs> in knots, and I weave him there. Now he's running up and down on the roof, yelling. So somebody get the mask off him. He was just, he gets mad, he had a mask off him. <laughs> he threw the mask off him. He was working for me. <laughs> Boy! That was gone. He was in WCW in 1989. The, no, it was 1990. It was May of 90, the last time they gave us a contract. Me and Bobby and Stan Lane. We came into the town that night, and Wahoo was one of the agents, and he had been at the book meeting that day because we were somewhere in Georgia. And he came up to us. He said, boys, I got good news for you. We said, what's that? They voted to give you another contract. They did. Herd didn't want to, but we all overruled him. And me and Bobby and Stan all through it and <laughs> threw our bags out. God! Damn it! Mind your own business. Yeah, you mind your own business, Who We wanted to leave. We didn't want to have it. We wanted to say we could leave instead of having to turn down money that we're being offered. We wanted to just go. And he said, well, that's the first damn time I've ever got anybody a contract and they got mad at it. He told me he, he didn't do anything for money when he was going to school in Oklahoma. So one day they offered him 100 bucks to drink a quart of motor oil. <laughs> so he drank it. I said, what happened? He said, nothing but when I sweat. And you should smell like my truck. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that was a double or nothing because actually the first bet was like 50 bucks that he couldn't run from Tulsa to the school. Tulsa to the, to the school or Tahlequah, wherever. And he did 20 yeah. something miles or whatever. And after he ran 20 something miles, he said, I'll be a double or nothing, drink a quart of motor oil. And yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't want to mess with. And Wahoo brought a, 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 a album one time. We were in Midland, Midland, Odessa. St. Martin, in Texas. It's where he's from, and it was where he was playing high school football, and there was a big headline, McDaniel scores 18 touchdowns, kills five opposing players for whatever big headlines with McDaniel. And then at the bottom, appearing tonight live, so-and-so, so-and-so, plus Elvis Presley, exciting new star. He said, see, why would McDaniel have been on top of than Elvis? <laughs> oh, yeah, he was... Uh... He was a wonderful guy. I liked him. He, he was a box officer. He'd go to your money. Yeah. He went to those chops. Oh, he, and when, when he was a heel, he would hit the fans that would try to attack him. He would hit them with the backhand chops, the same ones he used in the ring, and knock them over two, two rows of chairs. When you can hit a fan that's trying to attack you with a chop, and, and that's your mode of defense, you know that that thing is believable. Oh, he was, he was a tough guy. And he, yeah. he never cried or anything. He, um, he was different. I remember one day I found him in Georgia and he had a, a, a window smashed out of his car on the side. I said, what happened? He said, I locked my keys in the car. I said, don't you have a hidey key? He said, yeah. I said, where is he? He's in the grub box. <laughs> I said, you really did give away Manhattan for beef. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of guy he was, you know. But uh, I've enjoyed the business, the time I've been in it. Not, the times I didn't enjoy it. It's mostly the times, everybody always said that the motor screwed him. Screw this. Well, of course, but if we, if you're going to gripe about it, why stay? Go get another yeah. job. We knew what it was like. We stayed because we liked it. it as long fun. as it was fun. Yep. When it ceased being fun, that's when you gave your notice or moved to another territory right. or found something else to do because through all the bullshit and the fans sometimes not being the, the, you know, the nicest to you, even though you were trying to elicit that response from them, they went sometimes too far. It was still fun. You still enjoyed being around the boys, still enjoyed performing, doing what you And it felt good if you could create out there. If you could, uh, remember you pull up the high school summit and you buy the cars, you hey, it's going to be good tonight. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you're going to be seven cars and eight people work there. Yeah. You know, so you didn't know sometimes. So it's a, it's a different, it's a business you can't explain to anybody. They have to be in it. You try to tell somebody what the business is like, they don't understand. Well, that was in your book, the, the quote. It was, Classic. It was one of those kind of business where you never know how long you're going to be employed, how much you're going to make, where you're going to go, the whole thing. Yeah, just think if a guy said you had to be a wrestler, what will I have to do? Well, you don't have to go wherever I send you. Well, have you days it off? No, no. Um, will I get paid a lot of money? Probably not. Will I get paid off the house? I worked for a promoter once. I told us the house was 10 grand. It was really eight. We paid on six. <laughs> and we went to take these sharp pieces of razor and stick it in your face whenever we tell you to. And you're going to have to go out through the people and, and say riot. Uh, will I get any hospitalization? None at all. None at all. Will I get a car to drive? No, you have to drive your own car. Pay your own gas. What about the hotel room? Sit in the room. I don't care. Give me the job. Where do I sign up? I want to do this. <laughs> and here Tessa getting a herpes? Yes. Give me the job. 
Kyllä kyllä voi. Just pass me, let me open the door. Who would do that? What is your name? My name is Fred. They call me Bobby. I just had one on the house and I bought it on a work car. I haven't seen it for 40 years. I wrote California in my back. Never been there. I'm good, but I got to wait to even pronounce his name. I do for a living. But it's fun, damn it. It was fun. It's fun, damn it. Really fun. <laughs> You can, it's the fame and the glory yeah. of it all. <laughs> yeah. The, the glory of those... Uh, and the, I gave you two sisters once they were Siamese twins, joined the hip. <laughs> I could already date it for six months. How about that? I already had to go back to Amherst, so her sister would drive. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, take it! Yeah, 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 yeah. It was for the beautiful girls out in Beverly Hills and uh, at the clubs and the actors and stuff. You should see the mules we get, right? Yes. <laughs> Boy, you have to tie them up by the front. You can't bring them in the boat. <laughs> but at least they're agreeable. They are. They, they take you where you want to go and they'll pick you up at the airport. They're fine. Yeah, because my girlfriend now, she's like a faulty hair dryer. She barely blows it all. Well, <laughs> that's why they have Walmart. There you go. <laughs> why do I suddenly feel like Bud Abbott? <laughs> well, my wife and I never do a dog style. I sit up and date and she goes over and plays dead. <laughs> <laughs> Think about women. They're the toughest animal on earth. Tell me what other species can bleed for a week and live. <laughs> <laughs> really? They're tough. <laughs> <laughs> we have no finish for this bit, so we will take a small bow. And we'll be here all week. <laughs> so, <sighs> let's do more of these. Well, I think we should. Our ways, it must mean something. <laughs> it means we're you still getting paid at this age. No, I tell uh, you. I enjoy doing these, and that's, that's why I, I'm enjoying doing this. I would enjoy sitting here at any time, but I enjoy doing these because not only do they allegedly rumor to me that somebody buys them, but also that we get a chance to put this foolishness and ludicrousness down on record so people won't think that they're lying in 50 years when they try to tell these stories and there's nobody still living. Well, when we do prime time, I'm soon always say, God, I want to shoot with this. I wish I could really say, that guy shouldn't be there. He stinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do it, you know. I, uh, they called it where he, he was, the gorilla position. That's where he would send you to the yes. ring and back. Right, right there behind the curtain for the people. Right, and he's right there by the, by the entrance plate. And he said, no, go, no, go yet. And he's on headset to the track. Lights, music, okay, go. And when it's time to finish, he'll say to the guy in the mic, the, the ring announcer, sitting down there, not us, the ring announcer, like Mel Phillips. Right. He said, give it to him, Mel. Mel would put the pencil in his mouth. That would mean, finish, go home. The referee would say, Mel's got the pencil. Go home. Sometimes the guys don't finish. <laughs> Monsoon would get mad. He'd be yelling, go home. Hershey, part of Pennsylvania. He slams his headset down. He walks to the ring. He puts his hand in the bottom of <laughs> the He yells, go home, go home. Comes back. But see, now the referees are wired with this wireless IFB con communication system and everybody knows everything, and you can actually pick up instructions if you have the right reception equipment. You can actually pick up instructions that are flying around the building on your own radio. But back at like in Memphis, Guy Coffee, little short Mr. Coffee, was just with the promotion for many years, every time they were supposed to go home on Memphis television, Guy Coffee would walk through the door and just kind of walk out and stand there and watch the match. Glory right? Perry with Minneapolis. So finally they did it so long people got smart. They were watching, watching the match. They were really liked. They were getting into it. Here come Mr. Coffee and say, Oh, Mr. Coffee, go on back and let him wrestle. <laughs> there was all kinds of different. Nick, I won't mess up the audio too bad, but Nick Goulas would come out and do, give him the tie, wave his tie, right? <laughs> get the get out of there. You know how that started? <clears throat> Jack Pfeffer. Jack Pfeffer used to always wait the tie. He was in a show once. Yeah, he put his finger up his nose and he'd rub it on the head of your car. Yeah. <laughs> he kept that fingernail along just for such a booger picking a baby. Right. Yeah. He asked me once, he said, you take a good bunch, kid. I'll give you 50 bucks a week. It's only when you got the Tony Santos set at Boston. I said, no, thank you. But it's time to go home and it was hot. He took his tie off. He didn't reduce it. He reached over to the guy next to him and waved the guy's tie. <laughs> That's how that started. So who knows? But, uh, you know, and, uh, especially when, when something's going along and people are tearing their hair out, now the communication thing is better, but it was, all, it was a, a little bit better then when it was all on the fly. 
Did you get? <laughs> Who in, Duluth, in Duluth, Minnesota, it's 38 below zero. <clears throat> Bart Winkler's wrestling, Jim Burns out, sorry, Burns out's fifth match. Seven people in the place. They all got big coats in. It's 180 miles back from Minneapolis. 35 below. It's 20 minutes. I said, Nick, go home. <laughs> he says, Robert, he's got to learn. <laughs> I said, then take him home and beat him up in your garage. I'm going home. In two minutes, if you don't finish him, him and I are going to finish you, Nick. I'm getting out of here. <clears throat> so Nick went home. We said, but he has to learn. I said, not 180 miles away and 35 below zero. Let me moron. Now, when Nick was the champion up there, how, how much did Vern believe in doing our Broadways? Did they do me? No. I don't argue either. Nothing to solve. Well, it, every once in a while to say it was done just because then it's the holy grail of things. I couldn't sit there and I wouldn't watch Nick. I, it, it, <laughs> I couldn't. I, Dusty and, and Jimmy Crockett, you know, Flair loved doing hours. And I'm a Flair, and, and, and actually I loved watching an hour of Flair and Ricky Steamboat. You know, I can do that any time. But, but there were some matches that should never be an hour. I used to watch Briscoe and Funk Scene and Brisco, Dory. Yeah, Briscoe and Dory, an hour, great. But <laughs> for, even for the world tag tights, sometimes when we first, even back in the mid-80s, we still had to go an hour. One day in Raleigh, North Carolina, is an hour with Ronnie Garvin and Wahoo McDaniel. Mm. In a cold match with no angle. And and it's not that anything against Ronnie and Wahoo, but they weren't a regular team. There was very few people in place, right? But, and, and, and they hurt. Yeah. <laughs> it was cold building, too. You know, it was cold to chop. <laughs> and plus, <laughs> they're having to chase some of the guys back. Every time somebody's got to take a piss, you got to chase the heel back, or the baby face got to fight the heel back in the locker room so they take a piss or whatever. <laughs> hours, a lot of people want to do hours for saying you're doing hours. I know that, that Samoa Joe and, and CM Punk have just have just done that, and but they did it and got raves for it. But it's but it's called for when you got two guys that can do it. It's it's fabulous to watch because it's something that shouldn't happen very often when it does. It's well, that, that's designed to save the belt. Yes, and it's designed to save the challenger and the belt and everything. Yes, yeah, Nick, Nick and I went down to Jackson, Mississippi once and we were to our cash. One hour of Broadway with him. Came back, Vern said, what'd you do? We said, we went out with Broadway. He said, why didn't you beat the guy? I said, Vern, it was, the guy's name was Hoffman, the promoter or something like that. Um, um, uh, uh, in, uh, Huffman, uh, like no, uh, gee, Gil Culkin, George yeah. Gil Culkin. And I said, I said, Vince, if we'd have beat the guy, there's a top baby face. Yeah. We're, we're not there. We're there to put the, this guy, make this guy something. But, you know, that, that was made because with the champion, you don't beat him. So, yeah. either he beats you or... It's a swatification, a count out, or an hour of Broadway. Really? So when you see Flair do the same things over and over, <coughs> it's because you may have had four or five hour Broadways a week, and the people in Seattle won't see what you do in San Francisco, right. so you could do it in those days. Rick Flair and Ricky Morton did eight one hour Broadways in one week one time in, in the Carolina Territory, and they were all good. But now, on the other end of the spectrum, Randy Savage and, and Lanny Poffo, his brother, when they were running the ICW opposition to Jarrett, Savage was the ICW champion as the heel, and Lanny was the top challenger. Oh! oh. <laughs> An actual <laughs> phone call! I think Vern. <laughs> Hello. Hey, I'm on the air right now. I'm doing a show. I don't care if there's no money there to buy food. I'll call you later, Mom. <laughs> so, we were saying what? You know these women, they eat one day, turn around the next day, they want to eat again. She's got no teeth, what's he calling for? <laughs> she got one tooth and hangs down. Every time you take her to a bar, I don't feel like it. <laughs> but she's very for opening hands. <laughs> so, Savage and Lanny. Yeah. <laughs> They're going now for the ICW title in Frankfort, Kentucky. There's about 200 people there. So, they decided to shave at the time. So, actually, their hour Broadway is 41 minutes, but you know how I know? Same way everybody else knew, because there was a clock in that building that's about this big around <laughs> that was right over the fucking ring. <laughs> they rang the bell at 9 o'clock at 9.40, ding, ding, one hour, time wasn't expired. <laughs> no one's looking probably tough time. <laughs> well, it was the, that is the state capital, so there were certain legislators there that, that may be able to, but... Um, <laughs> I don't know what else, I don't know. <laughs> any, good, uh, any good prank stories, rip stories? I'm sure that could be a whole tape in itself. Actually, I've, I've told you a lot of mine. I'm, I'm just actually, uh, I'm setting them up so he can knock them out because I'm, you know, I'm not that entertaining and I, you've already done a couple of these on me, so I'm pretty well used up. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> sort of like my ex. I'm pretty well used up. <laughs> I used to watch to uh, watch the doors in the airplane bathrooms. You know how to do that? No. And there's a little nub there. It says vacant or occupied. Oh yeah. Take a nail for it. Pop it up. I used to watch all the bathrooms going to the <laughs> Japanese are the only race of people that were taught to take off from a boat and crash into another boat. <laughs> They'll do what they're told. So you watch the bathrooms after lunch. Now, you will see the Japanese people, they're very well mannered people and they'll stay on the aisle after lunch. Then you see them after a while and they'll start teetering. <laughs> then you see them on one foot. Then about an hour and ten minutes into that, they all start to smell like kitty litter. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the back of the plane, and actually Pedro Morales is up in the front row. He's looking back to see that bathroom opens. So he's <coughs> sitting, the, 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 the fasten seatbelt sign goes off, now he can get up. Now just as he comes, I open the door, I reach in, I get a Kleenex, I shut the door, and I, I pop it with my nail file. Well, Alice goes, he grabs the knob, and there's nobody there. So he's waiting. He thinks there's someone in there. So he will. Amigo! Amigo! I got to peace! Open the door! And we stop it. Now he's got his Gabardine pants on. But he can't say Gabardine. So now he says, Open the door, I'm going to piss my Gabardinos! <laughs> Oh, yeah. We had a sailor Art Thomas in the car once, and he had to go to the bathroom real bad. And I said, Ryan's and I are driving to Chicago. Okay, Art. He says, would you mind if uh, we pull over? Just a minute, how we find a spot? Oh, damn, one-way street. So we went that way for us, I'd walk, turn this way. Kept missing the Palmer House in Chicago. And we had to catch his bus to go back to Madison. Finally, about half hour away, we put in front. <coughs> Good news, Art. You can go to the bathroom. He says, I've, I've had an accident. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have had trouble. But you do that, you guys. You Stan know. Lane is real paranoid of, of cops, and it's not that he's got this large criminal background or something. It's just that he's, it's like, almost like he thinks that they put up a, a satellite in the sky just to watch the antics of this one guy named Stan Lane. If he's got a picture of a girl, and it looks like she might be nearly underage. This is used to before he settled down. He'd throw it away. And he'd go, he'd drive three miles to make any U-turn. He's just apparently, uh, cops going to see you, right? So one night we're trying to run. Well, here's Long Brown here in Bubble Bay. He can do a lot of time, you know. He's a little dark. We're in Miami. We're trying to find a building, right? And we, we don't usually go there. It's for Crockett. We can't find a thing. He said, I got to piss. I said, well, you stand right there in that dark parking lot. Just pull over and just lean out and, and piss, and then we'll go find this building, right? So he pulls over, and he opens... He turns the dome light off, right? He opens the door and he pulls his sweatpants down and he's sitting in the driver's seat with his feet out, pissing with his pants down, with the door open. He says, now you watch for the cops. And I wait till he gets a good stream going, right? And I say, oh shit, there's a cop. And he jumps back in, he pulls his pants up and he slams the door and the only thing he tried to do was stop pissing. <laughs> and he's like, god damn it, he gives me the chop. <laughs> his pants were wet. I mean, we go into the building, he's drooping and dragging down everything. But, yeah, the ex experiment stories are just the the yeah. things the world go around. <laughs> I, used, I used to go to um, Windsor, Canada, from Detroit, and I used to take uh, the midgets of uh, Sky Dover when they go with me, and the guys wouldn't take them because they have to drop them off a block away, and they just they don't be bothered with them, and they can't rent cars and everything. So Sky Sky take them with me, so I'd make them get in the trunk. And I drive through the, the tunnel, it goes from Detroit to Windsor, and you have to pay a toll. So I run drunk, and they say it's a dollar. So I do the, I press the button, trunk it open, there'd be this guy, he had his boots on his trunk, he'd have a dollar in his hand. He'd give the guy a dollar, he'd pull the trunk down, we'd drive through, everybody, everybody'd come out of the booth. So I said, so you gotta do, just do that, here, I'll take you for it. <laughs> when when they, they were bringing the Mexican minis up, the WWF, and, and they started a Shotgun Saturday Night Show, which was live from New York, oh God. And I, I, I make no secret, I can't stand New York City, I'm sorry. I, I just, I, I can't take the traffic, I get lost, the people, the crowds, the congestion, you can get killed driving around there. I, I don't like to be downtown New York. But this was shot in downtown New York every Saturday. So we got to go down to New York. And a different place most every time, but also we're doing location shooting. So they're bringing the Mexican minis in, and one of them is, 
I can't remember what he worked as down here, but they make him Mini Vader because he looked like a little Leon. <laughs> you know, Mini Vader, he had the outfit. It was hilarious. Leon, I don't think, thought too much of it. Or it just made Mini Vader as a back kick down. Maybe with odor ears in his shoes, right? Anyway. So. Or from your back. They thought it would be. <laughs> They said, they said it sounded like it was slapping somebody with a dead fish where he was kicking him with a split flop. But anyway, um, so they, they thought it would be funny for me to, to bring Mini Vader in since I was managing the regular Vader, but since I'm a cheapskate, I meet him at the bus station, all right? And then I, he has, he's jumping, he has to go to the bathroom, so I take him in, and, and now he's, he's too short, he can't reach the urinal, so he's having to jump out, right? Okay, so we're, we're commando shooting this thing anyway. We don't have any permits for anything. We've got a camera, and I'm dressed with a tennis racket, and like I am now, probably even louder. And here comes this Mexican midget with a little Vader mask, and the people got to be thinking, what the hell? Even this New York, it's strange. So we, I meet him, you know, coming off the bus, and go, come on, and he's like, well, we got to put that, whatever, okay, you got to go. So we go in, well, now the sight gag is lost because... I don't know whether they're handicapped urinals or what, if there is such a thing, but even the Mexican, the midget is tall enough to be able to piss into the urinal without having to jump. So the side gag is lost. I'm still trying to lift him up, but it ain't funny. And there, now, you've never been humiliated, embarrassed, until you've been trying to pick up a fat Mexican midget with a Vader mask so that he can urinate in a, in a urinal at the bus station in New York City with people looking going, what are you people doing <laughs> on camera? Yeah. What is this? Is this a new form of porn? <laughs> Mexican mini golden showers with a tennis racket? What's going on here? Remember WCW, they bring in 10 midgets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 10 Mexicans with masks. <laughs> they bring, with 10 I, of anything. I said, why don't you just bring in two guys? Four, why don't you just bring in two guys and keep 10 masks here? Yeah. <laughs> that was right, the same. Then they had a midget battle royal once. Mexican yeah. midget battle royal. And Dave Shop told me, don't come down on him. Don't make fun of him. He didn't understand the Bobby Heenan character. I got midgets out there dressed like pirates. Baseball <laughs> <laughs> players, Bobby Heenan can't see anything. He says, he says, they'll write in. I said, they can't reach the slot. <laughs> No, the only thing I can say is I can say this gonna, what, the, the, the Mexican midget lobbyists are going to write and complain? There's what? 10 midgets battle royal with masks. And the only thing I come up with, I said, to me, it looks like a riot at a daycare center. <laughs> <laughs> what else are you going to say? They always wanted to bring in 10 of everything to work. It wouldn't mean anything. 10 girls or 10 midgets or 10 guys with masks, and you couldn't tell any of them apart. Instead of focusing on one or two, they'd bring in just clumps of everything at one time and throw it out there. Like... They didn't know. That's why they're in business now. <laughs> <laughs> the riot at the daycare center. There, there is a strong Mexican midget lobby, though, that I think would have had. Who knew if they were midgets? They just maybe Mexican guys. Yeah, they were very sick. Yeah, but name, name, name four great Mexican basketball players. In, in Tennessee, they used to. It, or astronauts. It, well, there you have it. It's, <laughs> They have a space program. <laughs> they, they rent them at the bus station, the lockers. Um, in, in Tennessee, Nicholas always used to always like, I bet you remember, he'd do mixed tag matches where he'd have a regular-sized man, regular-sized woman, a midget man, and a midget woman against a team of equivalents, a little Darla Dagmar and Diamond Lil, and, and you know, all those sure. girls got to work, all those, yeah. <laughs> See, Honey Girl Page. I'm trying to think. The female midget wrestlers. Uh, okay. But that was uh, sideshowed its best because where can you find a normal sized couple and a midget couple, find another normal sized couple and a midget couple with a referee in the middle and it's actually legal? Very <laughs> <laughs> like that one. <laughs> you got midgets in your family? <laughs> yeah, this was before. And, and, and Springer wasn't on television, so you really had to pay to see this. Yeah. Stuff. It was good stuff. Yes. Sure. Especially when baby Cheryl would bite Cowboy Lang in the ass. And then, you know. Well, I never like to touch them. You never know where they've been. <laughs> <laughs> or how long they've been there, for that matter. I used to, remember Little Tokyo? Yes. I always put his pants up on the top hook. <laughs> <laughs> and he always had to do something to help him. He'd bring a beer in the dressing room, put the beer in the top of the lockers. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. But, uh... They, they're part of the business, too. They're human beings. Yeah, they but, work hard, too. But damn it, not anymore. When's the last time you saw a girls' match? That's bullshit. <laughs> no, seriously. 
We're missing out as promoters of the Ring of Honor promotion, the cutting edge promotion in the country, my the innovators, the leaders. Years, my daughter is 26 years old. And about two or three years ago, she saw some midgets on TV, and it was a wrestling match from a movie or something. And she couldn't stop laughing. She had never seen midget wrestling. There's a whole new audience out there that has never really yeah. seen midget wrestling. So, <laughs> go find them. I mean, they're, you know what causes midgets, don't you? What's that? Sex. Really? Yeah. How's that? <laughs> Having sex, so have a midget. Oh, no! <laughs> what do you think? You're buying them? You're renting them? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next week with more like this. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> ah, violated the cardinal rule of the straight man. I forgot the punchline. Oh, God. Um, my mind is numb. My face hurts from laughing. I'll tell you one thing. One. Um, in addition to no, uh, no oddities, I'm talking about abnormally large, grotesque people like Abdullah the Butcher and no <coughs> girl midgets and, and really no guy midgets that are of English or American descent, there, there, there's no good blow-off match in wrestling anymore. No good bluffs to block like the Texas death match or the cage match because now everything's been swerved around to where the, you're never sure that this is the absolute end, the finish, the blow-off, the by gum final chapter. I never That's liked, what draws. I never liked WCW when they had the champion in there against <coughs> two other guys. And whoever won the fall would be champion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I beat you, then he, you get his belt. That's so the champion doesn't need to get beaten to be to lose the and title. The title don't mean nothing. Yeah. And he don't mean nothing. That's why it is what said. They don't do that in football. They don't say in the NFL, okay, this team is the <laughs> champions, but they couldn't make it their bus broke down, so we're going to play this other team. If we beat them, then we're, the, you know, that, that, it, it doesn't work. But the, uh, like Vernon always was so strict about wrestling, has to be real. When's the last time you went to a Yankee game and saw a mess guy in the dugout? <laughs> When was the last time you saw that guy on the basketball court and you announced him from parts unknown? <laughs> when was the last time you saw a dick who grabbed the umpire, two bears close on the guy, take the ball and get it to the stairs, he runs in the end zone, you turn the up, and he goes, <laughs> you don't see it. When was the last time you were in a fight in the bar and you ass bumped a guy? <laughs> or beat over the guy? <laughs> it don't happen. Actually, Hacksaw Duggan when that alley did in Louisiana actually beeled some guy in a Holiday Inn bar all the way out of the bathroom, through the bathroom door into the lobby. But that's, that's Hacksaw and probably never be duplicated. However, wrestling has to have its credibility. It has to have credibility in its own particular little world. Because I always think that our job is to make the incredible credible and the preposterous posturous. So, in its own inane way, wrestling has to have credibility, but you have to start out by the fans have to know where the base is of that inanity, and then you have credibility from there. And you better, Winkle. <laughs> Ray, what the hell did you say? What he said, what he said is you, you gotta watch it. It's a piece of crap. You gotta watch. If you come off the rose at a forty-five degree angle, see. <laughs> this has been fun. It's it's like us. In our own way, we make sense. Yeah. If you just if you just follow us for the ride, we make sense eventually. It's just that you gotta know where we're coming from to get there. But we're not done either. We're putting out two new magazines, Waffle House Women <laughs> and Free Market Females. We should be a big hit. <laughs> but let's do some more of these. I think we should. We should. I think they should pay us even more money. I think all, everybody should buy two copies, one for yourself and one for your friends. And we remember, Christmas is coming up, and we need the money. We need papers? Uh, I'm going to put you on that. I got a room with something inflatable on it, but that's <laughs> okay. Better go call mom and see how she's doing. Actually, I just enjoy coming to Newark in the wintertime <laughs> and staying in the shadow of the airport. I feel all right about this place. You don't have to be in the road. You can come right from the airport to here. You well, yeah. In the van, you don't have to even go on the highway. And besides that, you don't even need cable. If there's a terrorist attack, you can just look out the window and you can see alive. <laughs> At home in Louisville, at the Cornetta State, I'm safe because if they don't want to blow up the Kentucky Derby, there's no reason for them to fuck with us. <laughs> that gold had been in Fort Knox 25 years. Well, any parting words from you? Um, 
<laughs> buy this one, buy another copy, buy the sequel. We need the employment. Managers are not doing too well as a whole in the wrestling business and stuff for a great of honor. How about a little hype for okay. tomorrow night's uh, great managerial debate between you two? We gotta do a debate. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me this. <laughs> You said we were going to come up and hug each other. I put you on here for seven hours and make you lose your voice and then put you in a debate. Yeah. <laughs> what if you cut my legs off and had me in an ass kicking contest? <laughs> he knows all my material now anyway. He's taking the edge off this shit. And I can't speak anymore. Yeah. <laughs> can't we just... Get there early. <laughs> can't we just sign autographs and, and show them we're still moving? <laughs> well, yeah, I was looking forward to it. And I was saying they have all these hurricanes. Dad calls me to do a radio show. He said, what do you think about the old people here in Florida? I said, we're only coming to Florida for three reasons. It's to play golf, go to the beach, or die. And I said, I think the older people over 80, you know, the skinnier ones, they should use them as sandbags. <laughs> and they, they retain some water. They can hold water. Yeah. And we need them. <laughs> and they don't do anything but get caught in traffic anyway, so this way they help them out. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. Ah, uh, tap tap, ding ding. Thank All you, right, folks. Thank you, Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you.